in the case of America and for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Again, good morning and welcome to beautiful and sunny Hurricane City. Gateway to Zion, gateway to Lake Powell, gateway to Grand Canyon, all the other places you want to be. And as we promised, sunshine is out there for you to enjoy. Yes, gateway We're going to have the first introduction. And then we will go there to that on the agenda. Let's go to my left. If you can start and your name and jurisdiction, please. Commissioner Kevin Van Castle and Commissioner at Large for the State of Utah. And I live in Vernal, Utah. Tom Law, I too am a commissioner at large. My home is in Cedar City, so I guess Hurricane is the gateway to Cedar City. Yes, the <laughs> Cedar City is the gateway to Hurricane. Commissioner Yes. Okay. yes. I want to welcome Jack here. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, good morning. My name is Lou Kramer, Commissioner at Large. I live in downtown Salt Lake, but after my wife went hiking yesterday in these incredible uh, trails, we may be moving to her. So thank you so much for your hosting session. Uh, Commissioner Jim Evans, uh, I have the assignment I get to work with. Region three, and of course, all the state. And I just have to say, I got to go to a new restaurant last night. I don't recommend it for the local, and it was fabulous. Uh, so, just we have it's wonderful to be down here with you. Thank you. You want to put the name on the record? The yeah, record. the record was Balcony One. I yeah. thought we were going out on a hike to Zion's National Park the way we went up the hill. I said, Rob, I think it's out here somewhere. And sure enough, there was rising on the left. So, we there were several good ones people talked about, but that was one of them we really enjoyed. Place down. Good morning, Natalie Gawker. I represent uh, Region 2, which is Salt Lake, Tooele, and Summit counties. Uh, reside in Larry and work at the University of Utah. Wonderful to be here with you today. I'm Rhonda Menlo. Uh, I represent Region 1, and I live in Garden City, Utah. And I just have to compliment you on what a beautiful place this is. Uh, gorgeous, and it's warm. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, and my name is Nagi Zanadi. I have a privilege of working with these wonderful people on this stand and just enjoy being part of the Utah family. And I have a jurisdiction over the remaining of the 14 counties of the state and the privilege to chair the commission. Now, I would like to introduce the Utah family. Carlos, would you please start us? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Carlos Maceros, I'm the executive director of the Department of Transportation. Would you like us to have that? Yes, please. Okay, you done, folks. You know how this goes. Cameron, you want to start off and we'll go yeah. back and forth. Uh, Cameron Gate, Region 4 Program Manager. Kirk Thornock, uh, Region 4 Deputy Director. Good morning. Monty Albert, Region 4 Director. Kevin Kitchen, Region 4 Communications. Lisa Wilson, Deputy Director, Engineering Operations. Ben Hewitt, Deputy Director, Planning and Investment. Eric Brasman, Region 3 Planning Manager. Rob Clayton, Region 3 Director. <coughs> Jim Manuel, Project Director, Washington County. Chris Hall, Region Planning Manager. Andrea Olson, you got Planning Director. Josh Andrew, Trails and Transit. Stephanie Hillcock, Over and Development. Stephanie Tomlin, Trails. Eric Beal, Trails and Program Manager. Bob White, Region 1 Director. Troy Peterson, Operations. Lee Founder, Legislative Affairs and Policy. Robert Stewart, Region 2 Director. Right, he did say. Brett Snyder, Region 1 Program Manager. Carmen Lovett, Project Development Director. Ivan Portal, Financial Programming. Bob Pelley, State Coordinator. Jane Young, Internal Director. Peter Aslan, with Policy and Legislative Affairs. Robert Miles, Transit Safety. Jared Beer, Region 4 Traffic Operations. Brian Anderson, Region 4 Pre Construction Engineer. Grayson Munson, uh, Southwest in District Engineer. <laughs> Grant Potter, New York Communications. Grant Noble, Technology and Innovation. George Lee, Technology and Innovation. 
And we will also recognize our executive secretary and head of our board. Without her, this organization will not even exist in this city. Thank you, Heather, for all the detailed hands you take and all the preparation of the food. Everything was great. I would love to also recognize our federal partner. Today, we have, I guess, excused the wrong Missy. Ivan Moreno is not here and Brigitte is not coming, but we have Kellen Ronspies. Perfect. Kellen Ronspies, Region 4 Area Engineer and Managing Project Delivery Team. Wonderful. Welcome. Thank you. I would love to also recognize our dear friend, Senator Don, Don, Epps, Don Epson here with us. Welcome, Senator. Just a brief statement about the pronunciation of the name of the city. Most of you call it hurricane and other varieties, but I'm going to tell you exactly why it was named it, the way it is. Hurricane was first established in 1896, received the name, the famous name, after the whirlwind blew the top of the buggy of the rest of the snow traveling through the community. And he just paused for a second. He says, well, that was a hurricane. We shall name the town Hurricane in his Liverpoolian accent. So Hurricane, not Hurricane. Okay. Now, as tradition, we're going to ask the mayor of the whole city to come forward and welcome us to her community and say whatever she desires to say. Thank you. Commissioners, I am so grateful to be here and all the community and senators. I'm grateful you're here as well because it's always a pleasure to address our community and people that come to our area. And I didn't bring the sun, God did, but I'm really grateful that it's here. And it's really awesome that you're here. And our awesome engineer, Arthur LeBaron, these are pomegranates and persimmons off of his property that he is offering to you today. So I hope you enjoy. They're both delicious. Um, I'm Nana Billings, Mayor in Hurricane City, and I want to welcome you here today. And I'm um, sorry, I had to speak at the chamber yesterday, so I'm just welcoming you when you first came to the city. But I just wanted to talk just a second about how important roads they play such a critical role in the connections in our communities by facilitating the transportation, fostering economic development, and enhancing social interconnection. They provide the access to education, healthcare, and job opportunities, and they contribute to the overall social growth and the cohesion in our community, which fosters unity, enables shared resources, and creates a foundation for mutual growth. And we have seen that in Hurricane City with the collaboration of Rock helping us. Each of those were projects in Hurricane that you guys allowed um, this um, partnership. It's improved that transportation and helping with goods and services, helping stimulate our local econ economy and creating jobs, um, especially during construction, but promoting businesses. And it, all also, it also leads to the tourism that comes through our city. Um, we collectively collaborated to connect our communities through roads and bridges, overpasses, public transit trails, and we got the state through integrated interconnection and infrastructure, enhancing the mobility. And we're working on that with a new transit because if it's going from Idens to Springdale, it's gonna really help. We have no traffic here. Supporting that economic activities and ensuring a seamless flow of goods and services across our region and contributing to the overall well-being and development of the entire state of Utah. And we see it right here in Hurricane. A few of the projects that have blessed Hurricane um, that UDOT has been in partner with us is this SR7, connects SR9, and we're really great for that connection. And from SR7 and SR9 interchange, if you, uh, on the field trip, if you were there, it went all the way to 600 North and that's 2800 West. And that's the first connection in Hurricane City that connects our city from the north to the south. That's the first one. So I just want to say how critical it's been that you don't play in that because the funding is so critical to be able to take care of a little city. But now we have a good connection from 600 North all the way to 3000 South. And we're working on our second one right here in the middle of town. If you come out of the city office, turn left, the first roundabout that's just been put there will go also to 600 North. So that'll be 600 North on 11, 700 West 
all the way to 3,000 subs. That will be our second connection. So we're really, really thrilled with having the connections. Um, Hurricane City and our surrounding com communities will also be enhanced by the following. So I'm just going to tell you about a few projects that are on the horizon that will really help this area. One is Sheets Bridge Road, and you probably talked about it already, but from SR9 over to 59, and that connection, the county is planning on working on that. Um, Zion National Park that is looking to prohibit oversized vehicles through the tunnel. Um, that's the reason that this road has even come, just the discussions of paving this road. And mostly for the safety and measure, um, it's aimed at preserving the park's natural um, architectural features and not allowing those oversized vehicles through the tunnel will prevent um, traffic hazards but ensuring the protection of the tunnel's historical integrity. These restrictions contribute to the oversize um, of the overall enjoyment of the safety of visitors that explore the park and Washington County Roads Department's plan to pay that connection. And this type of infrastructure project can improve accessibility and create new opportunities to the communities along the route, like Apple Valley, Virgin, all, especially if you're going to Hilldale and they're coming around, they won't be coming through Perth and the Perth and Tokyo Hill area. Another, pro, another project that we're proposing is a tunnel under the SR7 by San Paulos. If you edit the tunnel that is for ATVs, currently there's one. And I just want to tell you real quick why it's such an important um, ask. I met with Jeff Rasmussen, his state parks director. Are you sure that's his title? And he um, and I visited, and we visited with some of our legislators, and we're visiting again on uh, December 4th. And the ATV tunnel that um, is currently one tunnel, small, one machine can go through it. And when you have 1.4 million visitors that come to San Paulo, which is the most visited state park in the state, and they have to wait 20 minutes to an hour and a half to get through there because they'll let 20 machines go one way and then they stop it and let 20 machines come the other way. When you have three to 4,000 machines or 5,000 machines or 6,000 machines, which we have with events, it is a necessary ask for the community. I know that it's just such a beautiful place but it's frustrating when you have people have to wait. And you know how it is when you wait at a stoplight too long. <laughs> when people are there waiting that long, it sometimes can be very uh, a struggle. Another ask that we're working on is the San Paulo Road, which connects SR9 to SR7. And that is a city road, but it is the entrance to State Park of San Paulo. And it is a city street, but widening that road and the turning lanes. If you're here on any summer morning or afternoon, or afternoon, evening time, you will know what I'm talking about because it can be backed up a mile to turn into the park. And it is extremely expensive that you know for one city to do something, but it's caused by a state park. And so those are a couple of things that we're really asking for a little bit of a collaboration. Um, we are so grateful for the new solutions development study that you know is um, working with Hurricane City. And that, especially for our growing community, since it's growing, we're trying to find new routes off of SR9 that will help us to develop our city in a good way so we can have good connections. And also, we're working on some ground planning with UDOT for our trail system, and that's been approved along 600 North. So if you go from Grandpa's Pond all the way along 600 North, and we're so grateful for that, you know that the support of UDOT has really made that possible. We wouldn't have been able to do that trail. That we that we are working on right now. Um, investment in trails contribute to more connection and active community showcases the positive impacts of grant initiatives and local infrastructure and the quality of life for our residents. And we're really grateful for that. And I know that Hurricane City has a lot of big asks because we're a growing community with many needs. We're 54 square miles. We have 22% development. And so most of our community, well, almost 100% of it, there's a few that will properties, but pretty much we're private. So every developer in the state of Utah has looked to, to purchase and build in, in southern Utah. Yes, I can, and we know that we're growing. Um, but one of our bigger asks right now is a connection with three entities. One would be Washington County, Washington City, and Hurricane City, and that would be for Purgatory Road. 
So where purgatory, the, the prison, the jail right there, um, if you go through the landfill road, that's one connection, but it's closed because of the landfill not wanting to go through there. And so this would bring a connection with the three entities, but there's a bridge involved. So think of the cost for Little Hurricane or Little Washington or Washington County with that little tiny strip to have to pay for something like that. But we know that the connections from the industrial section of the purgatory area to rooftops is very important. And it's also brings another, right now our sheriffs, they only have one way in and one way out. And it matters for them with response time and to be able to get where they need to in our county. So that's another huge ask that we're hoping to moves forward soon. I just am excited to welcome you here and I hope that you feel our warmest um, welcome and if there's anything that we can help you with, let us know. But welcome to the greatest city of Utah in Hurricane. And it's Hurricane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I got a question. I mean, just like to say, the hospitality has been fabulous and congratulations on all its growth. We've made a couple of visits here over the years as commission. It's a new city every time we come. Yes. My wife and I got up at five o'clock this morning to see the day and night. And we just, there were hundreds of cars on the road yeah. at seven and um, seven through nine at five thirty in the morning. Yeah. I mean, this is a very busy part of the world. Who knew? We love this area and we would like to keep that small town charm. Yep. And we know that a lot of that comes from being able to connect because if yep. you live here and work here, yep. we have seven, more than 1,700 families that are home based businesses here. I know if people said we can live in Hurricane and not have to work somewhere else, okay, we'll do that. <laughs> and then they can rest where we have the both of the lakes, Wild Lake and San Paulo are in Hurricane. It's the best mountain biking, we have the best hiking, we have the best views, we have the best. We got it. All forces are here. Yeah. Sold me that. Congratulations. Rest, rest of snow is right. Yes. Yeah. Mary, you had a big list. Yes, I do. But just the one long grand of all is not going to pay for it. Emotions <laughs> need. So, Arthur, get them all up for the next meeting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. For those of you who did miss the Albert Snap meeting and the tour yesterday, Region 4, they got a beautiful showcase of the giving us lunch. Thank you. And the tour that we had a community project. So today we will have the, this morning local area presentation. I think one team is going to introduce us and then Karen can follow. Please. Yes. Good morning. Monty Alder, Region 4 Director. Again, I wanted to thank you for your time here. I appreciate the all of the dialogue and the opportunity to showcase the projects and yesterday on the tour and the information to share is very beneficial for us. Um, I'm going to kick this off with Cameron Gay, the program manager, is going to do our local area presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome, Commissioner. It's good to be here with you, uh, Cameron Gay, Region 4 program manager. Um, look forward to highlighting a few of the things you may have seen yesterday on our tour and uh, just uh, showing you a little bit about what uh, is happening down here in this little neck of the woods. So, um, we'll start off by giving give you a little highlight over the past 10 years. We've seen about 91 projects down here in the Washington County area, uh, totaling a little over $565 million in projects. Um, those projects vary anywhere from, a, from planning phases through constructing new roads federal state as well as local partnerships that we see with, with many of our partners down here so a substantial amount of work that takes place and goes on i highlight just a few of those um, you drove through our i-15 widening project from exit 10 to 13 with the new interchange on washington main street at exit 11. fantastic project we've received many many positive outreaches um, for the exceptional traffic control that's happening through this cohort uh, during construction, our construction crew and contractor have done a fantastic job here. Um, this provides a much needed capacity on I 15 itself and providing that third lane, as well as the local access to that interchange at, uh, at exit 11. Um, we then move on to our um, I 15 6 day. We've recently completed an EA study um, in this area. 
and um, currently we're pursuing um, the widening of I-15 under structure at uh, 700 South. Um, one of the benefits of doing this process is we've learned of an opportunity, an opportunity to provide a local connection. And so as a department along with the city, we've joined in uh, putting together a federal grant, the Reconnecting Communities Grant, to provide a, a crossing at 4th East and 9th South. Um, this crossing will allow great community access. Um, we're anticipating to potentially hear back on that uh, by the end of the year. And, if, if granted the, the opportunity to work on this grant, we combine that with this widening project. So fantastic opportunity for us in the city to join and look for opportunities to, to fund much needed projects. Um, SR7 has, has been going on for years and years. We've just recently last year completed the last phase um, of this project. You'll notice in the map, um, there are some corridor development standards provided at the, at the onset of this project. The large blue circles identify the recently significant interchanges that were completed by the department. Um, you'll, you'll notice on that map also a variety of other interchanges being proposed or in the process from locals or developers um, that follow those same local development standards, but provide a much needed opportunity um, for access on the corridor and, and development in that area. Um, we have uh, our SRA just to highlight a little bit there. Um, we had a resurfacing project come through. Um, with the recent emphasis on all users, we took a, a deep dive and looked into what opportunities we could provide for much safer access in this area. And in looking at this, we're able to provide buffered bike lanes on both sides of the highway, um, providing a much safer opportunity for cyclists, runners, and all different types of users. Uh, in connection with that, we've partnered with the city, the city, of the city in providing a, a, um, a signal and provide cross access, north-south access across the SRA. Um, and that is uh, currently in the works right now. So uh, a great project, a great opportunity to partner with them as well. We mentioned yesterday a little bit about the work on SR18, um, a preservation project that's happening up there. Um, good roads cost less. It's a philosophy that we live by as a department, and this is a great example of what that means, uh, taking care of what we have and, and projecting it into the future. So the project included a variety of, of upgrades as well, safety improvements, some widening turn lanes, um, great opportunities to, to improve the safety of this section. Um, last year, we completed a, a PET tunnel on the south end of Bluff Street. Um, many of you may have uh, heard about this. We've got a great picture of our, our chairman there in the bottom. We appreciate all that he does for us. But what a great asset this has been to the community, to the university, to all locals. Uh, we will partner with, uh, with many local partners on this to provide a great access um, fantastic construction coordination for minimal delays to the, through the duration of the project itself. Um, SR59, um, we've done quite a bit of work over the years uh, in this area. Um, in 2022, we've completed a couple shoulder widening projects and um, provided some realm strips. Um, we had a little different approach to trying to address some of the behaviors um, that we see on some of our highways. And so earlier this year, we uh, set out to provide a speed behavioral study approach. You know, what that entailed was some additional enforcement. We, we included some 12 inch wide stripe in this area to try to um, enhance the behavior of the drivers in this area. And this was a great partnership with our local authorities there. Um, we had a lot of EMS signing and, and different things happen and um, great opportunity to try to look at behaviors as they're a huge component of safety um, out there. Uh, just a little look ahead in, a long, in our long range plan. We currently have just over $25 million worth of projects that are slated or identified on SR59. And the Dixie MPO also has just over $115 million um, yeah, looking ahead in that long range approach. So good things to come for SR59. Um, just a quick look at some of the projects that we've been working on and those looking ahead. Uh, we talked about SR918, we looked yesterday under construction and near completion. Um, in 2024 and 2025, you'll see some additional work on SR7, 18, 9, and 15. Um, a lot of great preservation work happening. Again, good roads cost less, and it's a lot of okay. life and longevity of these highways in the future. Just a few um, local projects that are happening. Um, there are many, um, so these are just a few spotlights. Um, we have an SR7 Active Trails um, project that's uh, just beginning the design phases right now, about a $15 million project that'll happen along SR7. Um, just wrapping up the last phase of the Tocqueville Parkway project. 
uh, Northern Corridor, as we mentioned yesterday, Zion Corridor Trails and the Environmental Stages, as well as the Zion Area Transit Project, will provide a much needed connection and, and reduce the uh, overall use of our highways. So uh, here's just a, a scattering of projects uh, that have had local participation and partnerships that uh, that uh, will bring to your attention. I won't read through this list uh, as it's lengthy, but you can see there's a wide variety of projects anywhere from capacity to uh, some widening facilities and all users and roadway construction types of projects. So great work, great partnerships, and some great benefits added to this area of the state. So we appreciate the opportunity for to have you down here and we'll take any questions at this time. Thank you. I'm challenged Cameron three times. You only bred three times during the presentation. How do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can this much the region over all the region directors and deputies and engineers. Thank you for all. But uh, I have had so many calls from local Washington County people about this R18, the one Bluff Street, the buffer lanes for the bikes, this R7, this R9. I mean, it is just amazing that how many people now notice this, the hard work. At the beginning, of course, when they see the orange barrels come in and they Blocking the lanes, of course, everybody's just a pain. But once to see the ultimate result, they're just so happy. Thank you. Thank you all. Next item of agenda number three is a public comments. We have email comments, which Kevin Kitchen is going to read. He's the executive director of the Missy Communication for Region 4. Thank you. Please, Kevin. Thank you. I will be scripted. Okay. <laughs> Since we're just relaying the comments. Kevin Kitchen, uh, Region 4 Communications. Um, our first comment comes from Mr. John K. Black of Monticello. He says, I really question UDOT's priorities in southeastern Utah. Last year, they repaved 22 miles on Highway 276 to Halls Crossing, which probably doesn't have 100 vehicles per day. This year, they paved the needles over the road, which probably has less than that. Three people were killed on the construction of the turn lane into the needles overlook. UDOT cannot be proud of that. The main traffic corridor in San Juan County is 191 north of Monticello and 491 east of the Colorado state line. This highway has over 1,000 semi trucks per day, plus slow campers and lost tourists. The money needs to go where the vehicles travel the most. There are many places that passing lanes could be added economically. There is not one passing lane on 491 in the 17 miles westbound between the Colorado border and Monticello. When the traffic backs up, our four-lane Main Street becomes a racetrack where cars try to pass in town. Utah has made great improvements on 191 between Price and Green River with alternating passing lanes. This needs to be done between Crescent Junction on I-70 and the state line to Colorado on 191 and 491. Thank you for your consideration of my input, John K. Black, Monticello. We also have uh, two public comments from Mr. Mac Jones. <laughs> the engine brakes at SR9 and Telegraph. I have talked to Hurricane City Mayor, City Manager, Police, the UDOT Road Crew Manager, who said he would look into it, but two years later, nothing. The noise is often extreme and happens at all hours of the day and night from trucks coming off of the I-15 three-way engine braking for about a quarter of a mile to the line at Telegraph and SR9. The other thing is the intersection at Telegraph and Walmart in Robertson. <laughs> Due to the aero design on the road and the way the traffic light is programmed, the traffic will back up as many as 50 cars in the Walmart parking lot and 30 or more on the north side. I have talked to all the same people in Washington City as well as sent letters to Utah. I believe his name was. Even sent a letter to the Capitol in Utah to anyone who might care. Will anyone care in Utah? Questions to me on anything not well explained. And this leaves his phone number, uh, Mac Jones Hurricane. And a thank you. Also for Mr. Jones. So there are two trains entering the intersection with their horn blowing sounds like one train. Let me, I'm sorry, let me back up and just read the uh, subject on this one. He says, my idea on how to stop crashes between people and trains at intersections. The same company built the air horns for all of the front runners, so they all sound the same. 
Now the comment. So there are two trains entering the intersection with their horn blowing sounds like one train. The second train is almost always not being seen by the persons waiting to cross. Change the pitch or the sound of each train so a big difference is heard when the horns are blowing at the same time. Try to avoid the common sound of freight trains. Even a pitch change while blowing would be good. Old engines had a very loud bell to announce that they were moving. The bell was put only on the front of the train when it is ringing at the approach to an intersection with the other train leaving. It would be obvious that another is coming. And uh, three comments uh, from the Capitol Hill District regarding the roundabout. This is from Mr. Ryan Beck. Team UDOT, I'm writing in reference to the planned roundabout at the top of North State Street in front of the State Capitol building. As your team is no doubt aware that this evening's neighborhood council meeting, there's a great deal of frustration with the continued lack of coordination between UDOT and the community on decisions that greatly affect quality of life across the Capitol Hill Historic District. This roundabout being the most recent example, I recognize the legitimate need UDOT has for maintaining redundancy in its transportation network and understand the role Capitol Hill plays in that redundancy for downtown access. What I do not understand is why current UDOT policy preferences and encourages access to downtown through the Capitol Hill Historic District especially in how it manages signal timing off of Victory Road, Main Street, 300 North, and North State Street during peak travel times. In my conversations with Region 2 Director Robert Stewart, he suggested an openness to revisiting signal management to direct peak traffic away from the hill towards more suitable thoroughfares, including and especially 300 West, which has six lanes and is underused between Beck Street and North Temple during commuting hours. With no permanent changes to infrastructure, no closing down of roads, and no loss of network redundancy, UDOT could single-handedly significantly reduce traffic in the Capitol Hill Historic District by dissuading usage of Victory Road and North State Street during peak hours via light timing changes, and thereby significantly improve quality of life on this hill. I recognize this roundabout is very likely going to happen. After discussing with Director Stewart, I also understand and am sympathetic to why it is happening. Example given, directive came from above him. Utah was unable to run its regular processes. My only request is that as a show of good faith to this community, can Utah make a compensating change in signal timing to limit unnecessary traffic through a critical two-lane historic neighborhood? This neighborhood would view that as an extremely meaningful change, I'm confident. And it would go a long way towards resolving some of the anger folks feel about another traffic change designed to increase throughput. My understanding is that the traffic study required to justify that change in signal timing has already wrapped up with the Salt Lake City Transportation Department and could be acted on in relatively short order if there was the willpower to make it happen at UDOT. I have lived on North State Street for years. It is one of the crown jewels of the state. 100-year-old London plane trees framing the processional pathway to the majestic Utah State Capitol. There's a reason thousands of tourists walk from Temple Square up North State Street to the Capitol building every month. There's a reason thousands of protesters make their voices heard on this street every year. This district matters to the city and it matters to this state. UDOT has the power to return this historic district to its original role as a refuge from the city you have the ability to make this a place where people come in even greater numbers to appreciate its beauty and make their voices heard. And I'm confident you can do it with no meaningful loss in regional transportation efficiency. I hope you will, not just for me and my neighbors, but for the millions of people who will spend time on this hill in the decades to come. All the best, Ryan Beck of Staten. If we must have a roundabout, can we at least make that roundabout beautiful? Planter boxes or a fountain of some sort. This is such a powerful position in front of the Capitol building. It would be a double tragedy if it was just a cold concrete slab. Mr. Chairman, a comment on that? I, I live in that basically in the neighborhood. I couldn't agree more. And, and I haven't talked to Rob and Natalie about this, but it just seems to me to make a lot of it is a mess already getting up that hill every day and down and State Street. And, and I do know Third West is sometimes a, a freeway. Because uh, West High School is there, but that is really seems common sense. So one one neighbor's comment added to that, which comes from me. 
Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd love yes. to come in as well. I, that was a really interesting letter. I thought that the uh, reference to Third West and the unused capacity really uh, said something to me because we're not asking about more investment. We're asking about using existing investment more wisely. The comment about not following the regular process was disturbing to me. And then also the um, the notion of um, you get one chance to do this right. It's our, it's our, it's our state campaign. So I think we really need to pay attention to this. Thank you. I'll proceed. This letter is from Samuel Adams. Thanks. Utah Transportation Commission. Yesterday, I attended a presentation to the Capitol Hill Neighborhood Council regarding a roundabout that is planned for the intersection of 300 North and State Street in Salt Lake City. At the meeting, it seemed clear that traffic analysis has not been conducted in connection with this project, and that impact on residents and pedestrians has not been appropriately considered. The, present, the presenters did not seem to understand how traffic flows through this intersection. For example, given during the evening commute, most traffic is headed west, not east. Traffic backs up from the light at 300 north in Maine, and traffic is almost nonstop, so there would be no opportunity for residents trying to leave the neighborhood during these hours to enter the roundabout to get out. Additionally, it eliminated a crosswalk at this intersection in an area that has heavy pedestrian traffic, both from residents and especially tourists. I would like to see UDOT perform better analysis of traffic flows and pedestrian safety, both at this intersection and in this area. The presenters made it clear that the purpose of this project is only to improve this one intersection, although my fellow residents and I do not believe that it will improve the intersection for pedestrians or for residents. The problems at this intersection are a symptom of the dysfunctional traffic flow through the neighborhood in general, and an intersection cannot be changed without impacting the traffic pattern in the area as a whole. I urge you not to reconsider its plans for a roundabout in front of the Capitol, conduct a traffic analysis in association with this project, and communicate with residents and those who experience this intersection every day before implementing any solution. I also ask that UDOT consider what could be done more generally for this area to reduce traffic impacts, for example, given divert traffic to Main Street or 300 West, and improve pedestrian safety. Sincerely, Samuel Adams, Capitol Hill resident. And one final comment, uh, Mr. Samuel Two, also Capitol Hill resident. To whom it may concern, I recently attended a Capitol Hill Neighborhood Council meeting during which a UDOT representative presented a plan for a roundabout in front of Utah State Capitol at the intersection of State Street at 300 North along SR 186. In response to the presentation, I and many other neighborhood residents expressed concerns about the potential impact this roundabout would have on our area. SR 186 is a two-lane highway in the middle of downtown Salt Lake City that cuts right through the middle of our Capitol Hill neighborhood. I live on State Street between North Temple and 300 North. And I see the thousands of cars that commute through our neighborhood during peak times in the morning and evening. Traffic is often backed up between North Temple up to 300 North and then over to Main Street. A roundabout would only make travel through this area worse during peak times, especially during the evening, when it would become full of cars commuting through the north to west turn at the top of State Street back to Davis County. The intersection at State Street and 300 North is also very popular with pedestrians and tourists. They come up Capitol Hill from downtown to recreate on the Capitol Green and take pictures of this iconic area. The proposal did not seem to account for this heavy pedestrian traffic and even seemed to remove the east-west crosswalk at the top of State Street on the south side of 300 North. When presented with these and other concerns, the UDOT representative did not provide adequate responses. They indicated that the roundabout was not intended to address any of the current traffic flow issues in this area but was rather a simply a change to the intersection itself, parenthesis for I did it for ill-defined reasons, uh, unparenthesis. They also indicated that no traffic analysis has been conducted as a part of this project. The final proposal is complete and is slated for implementation next year. However, I am deeply concerned that the proposed roundabout will not improve and will likely aggravate current commuter traffic concerns in our neighborhood. UDOT and its partners on this project should work to better understand, analyze, and address the concerns and interests of all involved, including local residents. They should accept and respond to feedback in meaningful ways, instead of moving forward without broad consensus. 
Additionally, the traffic issues of this particular intersection are a symptom of a bigger problem. Commuter traffic between Davis County and Salt Lake City travels through the middle of our neighborhood on two lane residential roads. Even if this has been designated by the state as a highway, these roads, especially State Street north of North Temple, 300 North and Columbus Street, are not well equipped to deal with ever growing commuter traffic. There are large four to six lane roads out of the outer boundaries of our neighborhood, North Temple and 300 West. In the long term, diverting commuter traffic to these roads makes much more sense than continuing to funnel traffic through the heart of the Capitol Hill residential district. Let's take this roundabout discussion as an opportunity to improve the resident, tourist, and commuter experience in this historic and iconic area of Salt Lake City. Thank you for your time. Samuel to Capitol Hill. Thank you, Kenneth. Mr. Chair, is there any follow up that we can do on those comments? Carlos? This is not an email problem. So we're not driving this. We are going to facilitate the construction and the design because it is on our road. So. so it's a Division of Construction Facilities <coughs> Management Project. Driven by the Capital Preservation Board. I wonder if we could um, send a letter to them or something as a commission to just uh, express that this is uh, a troubling um, development, that a really important part of our state is being done outside of the process and at least slow it down, talk through the issues. One of the comments there that was really interesting to me is when it, it mentioned the roundabout, the traffic that goes through the roundabout. When you're doing a commuter through the roundabout, nobody else gets in. And, and then when I heard the pedestrian comments, I, I, I've worked in this area a lot, so I know the intersection now, and it's in the region I represent. Uh, the pedestrians there are a significant feature, right? It's where people take pictures in front of the Capitol. It's where protesters do, you know, do exhibit their rights. <laughs> and to have that flow going through there with all of that happening seems to me like we need to do a little bit of time out and think through how we can make a better decision in a really important part of our state. And I'm just asking, what could the commission do? Um, let me have a conversation with you offline so you have a full appreciation of the dynamics behind us. That's fair. And, and Nadia, yeah, I just would ask that we have some way to follow up on not just hearing the comments, but thinking about how could we help the state here? Not, not get in the way of anything, but help the state. The, the reference is to this came from above, which you know means that it was something important to the governor or someone else in our state. And I have complete faith in our state leaders, but I think they need to understand even more. Thank you. Oh, well, um, Ronald, do you have comments? Yes, sir. Please. <laughs> Uh, Robert Stewart, Region 2 Director. I, I'd like to just add that there's two overlapping concerns here. There's the roundabout project, which I think we've heard from, but um, the other thing is just the traffic within this area. And I think that those are overlapping, and I think they're kind of being brought together, but they're distinct. Um, and I think that we can do things for the flow of traffic through this, through this area. That's distinct from the room. Okay. Thank you. And, and that makes sense to me. I, I get what's being said there because there's there's an <clears throat> incredible usage that's a problem even separate from the roundabout. And there's alternatives that if the state wanted to use 300 West more efficiently and North Temple more efficiently, right now there's two turn lanes from South Temple to go up State Street, two turn lanes, which is facilitating more and more traffic. If you just went to one turn in there and directed more to Main Street or to um, Third West, it would take away from this intersection and help everybody. So I think there's some, this isn't one of those things where there's not alternatives, there's lots of alternatives. And the fact there's always construction going on in the area doesn't help either. Thank you. At this time, I'm locked in wide the Senate to. Don Epson, if he has anything to say, if you want to have a shed lights in the situation at the Capitol Hills, in the inside, outside. Well, I to touch that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever else you would like to address, please. 
Well, I'd just like to welcome the commission to Southern Utah. Carlos, I appreciate what you and your team do for the state of Utah. You're an incredible leader. This is my esteemed colleagues from the legislature here, even Jack. <laughs> yes, yeah, Jack. And I just will tell you that UDOT is a very well run organization, and how you guys deal with raising people at the legislature to <laughs> the citizens of our state. You know, we, we heard some, they all have opinions on how things should be done better in their. And sometimes this input is really good. You know, there'd be one choke point on that to run traffic to 300 West. That light at North Temple and Main Street is a disaster because the foot traffic and the people going to Temple Square, and you get the traffic that comes out of the parking garage right there, too. So it, it's not as simple as let's just send them over there because there'll be a choke point that it won't let the traffic through. But I just appreciate we got a lot of great projects going on in Southern Utah and the commission has treated us very well. And I just appreciate what UDOT does for the state. And we're, we're really lucky to have great leadership and you got a great team that supports you. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. And I just must say, Echo the center stuff, but the center and the legislature have certainly been good to you, Dodd. So it's it's a great combination you get. It. So thank you, Senator. I see that the mayor, Western Morgan, come from the. You still have something to say, or you done yesterday? Okay. <laughs> because I want to make sure that you had your opportunity. Okay. I'd love to open the comments for the floor. Anyone in this? Audience will have to have to come before the podium. State your name, please. Hello, my name is uh, Mike Farrar. I'm a resident of Apple, beautiful Apple Valley. Um, thank you guys for the opportunity to, to uh, talk today. Um, I'm also planning commission chairman, and Tuesday uh, looks like I'll be mayor. 75% of the vote in the primary. So we're just a small town of 900 people, so we don't have a loud voice. But I come to you today not to criticize or anything like that. Um, I don't come to you with problems about traffic. I come to you with a life or life situation. You guys have the power to save some lives. We have an issue up on 59. It's a very dangerous. No, I don't want to say it's a dangerous highway. I think the highway's safe. People call it a dangerous highway. Drivers are dangerous. The highway's fine. Unfortunately, I don't know how we're going to get to that. These people to drive right. We can step up patrols. Some money up there would be great um, to step up patrols and enforce. Uh, we don't need traffic studies. I know there's traffic studies and stuff. I've been up there. I've only been up there a few years, but I talk to everybody. And the issue is impatient drivers. You get a truck. You get people doing the speed limit. I'm a rule follower. I do the speed limit. This is kind of new. I'm, I'm actually from Southern California. But these Utah drivers like to get about, you know, 12 inches off your bumper, even when you're, when you're even going over the speed limit, and then they pass. And they pass on curves, they pass double yellow, they pass everywhere it's unsafe, and we have a lot of deaths up there. Um, and I think you guys have the power. What's the solution? Uh, we can mandate it. We don't have shoulders. We do, there's a lot of biking events that come up there, which make it even more dangerous. Why anybody would get on a bike and ride up there is beyond me. But it's also dangerous for the cars because we have to move over and now you get head on. Uh, we just recently, I don't know, a couple months ago, there was a 16 year old, a car full of 16 year old kids, a couple of deaths. Um, it's, it happens often. Uh, what I'm asking is for you guys to step in and protect people from themselves and protect us. There's only one solution and it's a, it's a huge money thing that needs to be a four lane highway. There's, we can mandate it. Uh, way growth is going, it's not going to get better. It's just this area is growing like crazy, more and more traffic. Someday it's gonna have to be done. Let's start doing it now, let's start the process. Um, like I said, I'm a small I'm mayor, it's 900 people. I'm gonna be going to Hill. You'll hear more from me, I'm gonna be going to Hilldale, Centennial Park, hopefully Hurricane. We all share this concern of people driving on this highway. And you know, my wife, my kids, my grandkids, your families may drive on that highway. And it is very, very dangerous. 
again, I shouldn't say that. the highway is not dangerous. The people driving on the highway are dangerous. And I don't know how else to stop it. I asked you guys to look at it. Um, it's not a matter of conveniences, like some of these complaint word, complaints are. This is a matter of you guys being able to save lives. There's no doubt in my mind, even if you save one life a year, I know it's a lot of money, but it needs to be done. It, it's just going to get worse and worse. And we're going to be sitting here five or 10 years from now with more deaths, and it's going to have to be done. And then you're going to be shutting down highways and creating more congestion. So let's let's get ahead of it. Let's get ahead of the issue and address it. So that's all I come here to ask of you guys. And uh, appreciate everything you guys do and the work you put in. Sure. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, I came in from Vernal. I made a detour through Canab and came across 59. And uh, part of that was, as I know, we did the striping there. Mm -hmm. And uh, my experience was what you're describing. Uh, I was doing the speed limit, maybe one or two miles over. I, you know, I don't know if they're right exactly, but it was the locals that was passing me. It wasn't those of us that aren't that familiar with the road or the out-of-state people. It appeared to be people coming in, and, you know, they were just in a hurry. So, you know, we've got to get out of this habit the state of Utah that we do. We, if we go 10 or 10 miles an hour faster than what everybody else is going, we're safe and they're the problem. That's not the issue. So we're aware of that. I'm aware of it. I appreciate that. Uh, you've had some growth. And I realize that you've got a lot going on. There's a lot of trucks, quite a few trucks on this highway that come across there. And uh, I noticed that as I came through there that the Arizona Patrol was out working Arizona pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. Yes. I passed three officers out doing their jobs, which is kind of what my uh, people pulled over. So I think, you know, but your local people are the ones that's going to get the fines and the tickets. Sure. sure. But maybe that's what they need to do that. All for it. But that's the, only, that's the quickest thing we can do is increase enforcement. So yeah, we need more on the Utah side. It's, uh, it's yeah. a little more, I'm sure it's a funding yeah. issue. I don't know. They, I see them up there. They do a great job. But unfortunately, like I said, it is. It's local. I follow people. I've seen where they go. I don't, you know, not to go harass them, but I just see there's a lot of local. But unfortunately, there's a group of us, or the majority of us, that are obeying the laws, and we're the ones that are getting killed, and we're the ones that are put in, put in bad situations. So, I mean, you can only enforce it so much. So, um, I just kind of got to save people from them. Sometimes uh, organizations like yours have to step in and save people to sit from themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Anyone else? Please. <laughs> Commissioners and uh, Director Sarah, appreciate your uh, the opportunity you've given me to present today. I'm Myron Lee. I'm the Dixie MPO uh, Director and the Five County Association of Governments uh, Transportation Planning Office Director. Um, I've often heard my good friend uh, Arthur LeBaron uh, thank the MPO for the scraps that fall from the master's table. And um, from Cameron's presentation earlier of a half billion dollars worth of projects here in the last 10 years, we would like to thank you, Doc, for the four jobs that you give us. We thank you. We thank you for that. Uh, State Route uh, 18 underwent a, a safety study several years ago, and there there were some projects that were identified on that road to improve safety. Those projects are now underway and they're being built. We appreciate that. Uh, I-15 widening from 10 to 13 was needed. There was a comment earlier today about the traffic exiting Walmart in that section. Uh, we anticipate that the opening of the new interchange at exit 11 will alleviate some of that uh, queuing uh, and, and improve that intersection uh, and, and the surface roads in that area, uh, along with improving travel on the 15. Um, the, the northbound off-ramp at exit 10 was backing up on, uh, occasionally threatening to back up into the mainline traffic on I-15, which would create a very dangerous situation. 
and we feel like that will also be alleviated by this this uh, current widening project. Uh, the coming project between exits six and eight on I-15, uh, we toured that yesterday. Um, that that project uh, also uh, promises to alleviate some of the congestion at, at the intersections interchanges. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the one of the things that was postponed in that widening project was the installation of an exit seven at seven hundred south in St. George. Um, that that interchange uh, has the potential to uh, further alleviate the off ramp queues at uh, exit eight and exit six. Uh, the, the north southbound off ramp at eight and the northbound off ramp at six. Um, I, again, traffic is backing up on those off ramps uh, as people try to get onto the surface streets that are also congested, but both that we're working with the cities and the counties to, to try to alleviate those. But again, we thank the we thank you for the the, uh, the, the participation that you guys have done in those projects. Uh, uh, I can't speak highly enough of the State Route 7 projects that have gotten uh, infrastructure into the area before the explosive growth uh, that we're having down in this area uh, reaches uh, a, a point where the right-of-way is no longer available. We've, we've been able to get out ahead of that, and that's a, a, a very well thought out and, and executed project. I might mention that um, we're not finished yet. <laughs> uh, St. George and the, and the Hurricane Washington area have been listed as uh, Utah's top 10 cities for growth for several years running in, 20, in 2018. Uh, the the St. George area had three of the top 10 cities for growth. Um, this last year, uh, a couple of the cities dro dropped off that top 10 list, but we are still seeing a, a tremendous amount of growth in this area. Uh, we, we've gone from a community of 135,000 residents in the county back in 2010 to today, we have nearly 200,000 residents in Washington County. We had a, an accelerated growth rate uh, pre-pandemic and the pandemic actually blew everything up because, because people could work from home, they chose to work from home here. <laughs> we have, I have a neighbor who works in Denver from the house two doors down from me. Um, and, and there, there are others. My, my son, when he vacations from New York, he continues to work from my home here in St. George, uh, and, and he maintains his, his employment there. But we, because of that growth and, and, and the acceleration that the, the pandemic put on us, uh, we, we continue to, to grow. Uh, State Route 9 uh, through from I-15 all the way through Hurricane, is seeing a tremendous amount of increased traffic. The solution to that, uh, the, that uh, UDOT was able to identify in an environmental impact statement a couple of years ago, is to improve the interchanges, uh, or excuse me, improve the intersections on, on State Route 9 to freeway interchanges, and then to eventually widen the, the, the route into a a freeway standard from I-15 all the way to State Route 7. This is this is a high priority project on our MPO uh, long range plan. It's it's a priority for uh, UDOT, and we we're, we're hoping we're hoping that we can find some funds for that uh, solution in the next uh, funding cycle uh, coming up. Uh, that 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 uh, project would render a great deal of relief to the traffic in that area. I noticed this morning that the commute from Hurricane to St. George was heavy, but the commute from St. George to Hurricane was also fairly significant. Um, and, and that route is a, a critical route to us. The MPO participated in a, in a is participating in, in the creation of an interchange on State Route 7 right now at George, 
George Washington Boulevard. Um, it used to be 3650 South and it used to be 1450 South, uh, depending on whether you were in Washington or in St. George. And as, as that road began to become an, an east-west corridor from State Route 7 all the way over to I-15, uh, we asked that the city's name the road a consistent name throughout, and they came back with the, with the name George Washington Boulevard uh, to, to signify the, the handshake between the two cities uh, in, in creating that east-west corridor. Um, Again, that interchange would not have been possible without the creation of State Route 7. Uh, UDOT is not currently participating in that uh, project financially, but they are managing the MPO project. And, and again, we appreciate the help there. Uh, State Route 7 will, will also need an interchange at Exit 5 uh, at, in St. George City, and, and other interchanges are coming up as development. Uh, warrants those and and to a great deal on the backs of the developers in, in building those. Um, I cannot emphasize enough the need for a northern corridor uh, to connect Washington Parkway uh, on the east over to uh, Red Hills Parkway on the west uh, and, and, and up actually tie into State Route 18 and Snow Canyon Parkway on the on the west. Uh, the nor northern corridor has been worked on con in in conjunction with UDOT, the MPO, Washington County, St. George City, Washington City, Ivins, Santa Clara, and I believe that Hurricane's also in that mix as it serves a, 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 a service to this area as well. Uh, the northern corridor will re will reduce the pressure the traffic pressure on the on the cut as you're coming into St. George just north of St. George Boulevard that cut currently hosts 16 lanes of traffic through there three in each direction on the freeway and five lanes on each of the two frontage roads uh, and that's a that's a bottleneck in our community where, where traffic is all squeezed into that area uh, because of the geographic features of this area, the northern corridor has the offer, has the potential to alleviate that, and we, we would ask that you not continue to to press forward with that project. Uh, there has been a few setbacks on that project that we uh, are are determined to work through and and make the, the road a, the best possible solution that we can get, not only for uh, drivers but and, and motorists, but also for pedestrians and in favor of the uh, desert tortoise that, that resides through that area, uh, there is a, a, a strong, uh, well thought out plan to accommodate the, the needs of the, of the wildlife in that area. And uh, I, I think in the coming days, we'll be able to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but again, I, I would encourage you not to continue looking at, at the Northern Corridor as a, as, a, as a vital link in our transportation system. Um, County Commissioner Iverson was not able to make it here today because of, of prior obligations, but he asked me to also uh, mention the Northern Corridor. Commissioner Iverson and I occasionally agree on things, and this is the one point that we agree uh, wholeheartedly with. Uh, so we even uh, sat by each other on the bus yesterday. So. <laughs> we we did, and we got along quite handsomely. I can witness to that. But but there are there are there are a lot of projects that are needed in this area. Some are county responsibility, some are state responsibility, and some are the responsibilities of the cities and the MPO. We we continue to work together and, and to to enjoy a, a good working relationship. As as was mentioned by uh, Mayor Billings earlier in this meeting, uh, we we appreciate the um, that that working relationship and that that ability to get along. And uh, I, I feel like I'm droning on. The, the MPO, I, I need to mention this, the MPO recently received a million dollar grant from the uh, uh, Federal Highway Administration to look at safety and to create a safety plan. That, that project is well underway. We have identified 
excuse me, we're in the process of identifying a, a high injury network where we've, we've uh, looked at fatal and, and serious injury accidents. Um, we've had several fatalities here in the last month, the last three months, and we've looked at those and, and they, they are disheartening. All of them are. Um, we've got to get our head around how to improve the safety and reduce the number of serious injury and fatal accidents. The plan that we're developing will ultimately result in a, in a list of projects that can be done to that end. Uh, as, as we continue to identify those projects and work through them, uh, there will be a call for action from UDOT, from the cities, from the county, and from from the MPO, and we would ask that as those those projects come to light, that we could use some safety monies, or maybe even an increased amount of safety monies, to address uh, the, the safety issues. Um, the the gentleman from Apple Valley who just spoke to you, uh, it is is accurate there that road needs uh, attention uh passing lanes would be appropriate the the striping that cameron gay spoke about earlier today seems to be having a, a positive effect um that's an experimental project uh and but anyway uh we, we will have that list of projects from a safety perspective in the near future and we'll we'll come back and ask uh, for your support on that uh, with that i i close out my comments thank you for your time and for your interest in this area thank you Myron. anyone else seeing none i would like to have to go to the next item uh, we have a special presentation to region four by Southern Utah Bicycle Alliance and the Healthy Dixie Council. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Nagi. Uh, as we approach the great American holiday, I'd like to pause and, and just make a few points on gratitude. I'm grateful that we have this opportunity in America for people to approach uh, government entities and, and say their peace. It's a really great thing. And I think a lot of times we take it for granted. Um, I'm wearing orange. This is my team UDOC shirt. A lot of you are wearing your Sunday vest. So I reserve that kind of apparel for Sunday. Uh, speaking of which, a couple of weeks ago, church had just started. The opening hymn was underway. And I got a notification. It was an email from Mark Taylor, who works in the complex. In traffic and safety and he i'm like why is mark taylor emailing me on sunday afternoon and so i look at my phone while everybody else is singing and he's like hey arthur just so you know there's a fire on i-15 and traffic is backing up and it's being rerouted through hurricane on sr9 and i am bumping up the green time on the signals to try to accommodate the through traffic and I was like, wow, I'm grateful for my relationship I have with Mark Taylor. And I was able to text the mayor and the, the chief of police and let them know what was going on. And they were grateful. Um, so the relationships we have matter. And that's how we really get things done is through our relationships. And uh, I work uh, just about every single day with the staff at Region 4. And I'm grateful for them and all that they do and the partnership that we have. Um, at any rate, I'm uh, part of a, the board for the Healthy Dixie Council, and we promote health and wellness. I'm also part of uh, the Southern Utah Bicycle Alliance, and we have a special award that uh, we would like to present to Region 4. And I'm going to have uh, Mark Mortson, who is uh, with the Southern Utah Bicycle Alliance, and also he's uh, staff at St. George City. I'm going to have him uh, take it over, but thank you for having us today. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, I, I apologize that we did not get the memo to you folks early enough about <laughs> Casual Friday. Uh, I've never seen so many Region 4 uh, in suits before. Uh, looking bunch. Uh, I had no idea. I have the official St. George City uniform on today. 
uh, which is I love St. George, and uh, be happy to get you one if you want one. <laughs> we love St. George. We also love Hurricane and the entire Southern Utah area. Uh, again, my name is Mark Mortensen. I'm the Director of Operations for the City of St. George, as well as the past president of the Southern Utah Bicycle Alliance. Uh, good morning, UDOT Commissioners, uh, Executive Director Braceros, uh, UDOT staff members, and uh, my dear friend, uh, uh, Commissioner and Chair uh, Zinna. Um, I'm here before you this morning to express appreciation to this commission and our Region 4 staff for the close collaboration and partnership on numerous projects, including the Bluff Street uh, Pedestrian Tunnel with the City of St. George and the Southern Utah Bicycle Alliance. It's projects like these that make true multimodal transportation options possible in St. George for its residents and visitors. The importance of active transportation infrastructure for our economy, tourism, safety, and collective health as a community cannot be overstated. Due to advances in technology, e-bikes and other electric vehicles can be found on our streets and trail networks year-round in Southern Utah for both recreation and transportation purposes. E-bike sales surged 270% between uh, 2019 and 2022. Last year, over 1 million e-bikes were sold in the United States alone, outpacing electric vehicle sales by 40%. With these recent changes in transportation preferences, our Region 4 Director, Monty Aldridge, behind me, and his amazing staff have been eager to listen, learn, and implement measures to ensure motorists and cyclists can safely coexist in our communities. Uh, we also, I also want to express appreciation for the addition of, of Stephanie Tomlin and the Utah Trail Network. We look forward to working with her. She's already been involved uh, throughout Southern Utah and uh, a great addition to the UDOT team. With that, I would uh, just express to you that uh, I hope you enjoy your time in Southern Utah. And I'd like to again express appreciation from the City of St. George for the partnership, as well as the partnership with the uh, Southern Utah Bicycle Alliance. Thank you for your time. So how do we do that? <laughs> I think we should invite uh, Monty and uh, Kim. Who, who else? Uh, for me, Dr. Sondra. Monty, you can who you are. Now. We want to get a picture. Get a picture of those guys. Cover up that tie, buddy. It's a Norman Rockwell. Not a lot of people would recognize that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there. Yeah, you. Aren't you both that in the room? Oh. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for coming. Next item on agenda is uh, item number four. Federal Highway Association uh, Administration. I'm going to ask Colum to come back and represent. Thank you, Mr. Zanotti, and thank you, rest of the commission and Mr. Baceres for having us here today. I also want to thank uh, the City of Hurricane, Heather, and Region 4 for putting on an amazing last couple of days. It's been fantastic being down here. Uh, getting a feel for the community and the region. Um, my name is Kellen Ronskis. I'm a Region 4 Area Engineer with the Utah Division Office of Federal Highways, um, acting as the Project Delivery Team Leader for now. Um, just got a few topics that we wanted to touch upon with everyone today. Um, first one being a notice for proposed rulemaking change regarding work zone safety and mobility, temporary traffic control. What these notice for proposed rulemakings are is when there's a change to federal regulation, they'll place that in the federal register and kind of outline the changes and open that for public comment. And so this has been open since September until November 20th of this month, it'll close. Um, basically a few of the changes within here are aligned with the priorities of both UDOT and federal highways, and those are safety and mobility. 
Um, with those, there's some new definitions, some clarifications of definitions regarding safety, mobility, temporary traffic control. Um, additionally, there's a new requirement of states with their work zone safety and mobility policy to define performance measures for safety and mobility and to evaluate those measures. Um, some of those may be things like travel time or delay, things like number of crashes, types of crashes. Um, so tracking those performance measures to kind of identify how your work zones are performing. Um, additionally, there's been a reframing of the work zone process review to be, instead of being a biannual two-year item, it becomes a five-year yeah, item. So, so these process reviews are going to cover longer spans of time, give us a broader perspective of what we're looking at. Um, additionally, here we got a few recent Safe Streets for All grant awards. Um, so these are planning grants so that these communities can, can use some federal dollars to improve safety in their communities and plan for long-term sustained success, success in that area. Um, additionally, yesterday we were, were excited to find out that Utah or UDOT was awarded an Advanced Digital Construction Management Systems Grant. And what that's going to do, that's going to help UDOT advance their efforts in digital construction. And so um, geographic information system mapping, they can, they can fly drones over things, they can map that area, they can have a digital plan set versus the traditional PDF plan set. And then that is stored in the system and they're able to, to modify that plan for construction in the future. And so eventually, Roads can be uh, mapped in the virtual space, and you can build your plan sets off those. So, very good record record keeping system, um, and, and we're very pleased to announce you got received that grant award yesterday. How, how big was that grant? Well, right. Thank you. So, yeah, congratulations to you, Dot, on that award. Yeah. And then uh, last item here, we've got to notice the funding opportunity for accelerating vehicle to everything deployment, that's to x So that's things like autonomous vehicles where UDOT's one of the privileged states that that's, has authority to run some autonomous vehicles along their roadway. And so, so with this, there's $40 million available in federal funding. Um, I believe they plan to give two awards for this. It's, it's pretty small. Um, eligible applicants include public sector organizations, um, not necessarily government organizations, public private entities. UDOT's an eligible applicant as well. Um, so we hopefully we'll see some of those come in from, from our Utah partners here. And uh, hopefully we can help accelerate some of that autonomous vehicle stuff here in the great state of Utah. And that's really all I have today. If anybody has any questions for me and for Federal Highways. That was easy. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's not an easy button now. <laughs> he was worried about his presentation this morning. I told him that don't worry, just close your eyes and well, thank you. Wonderful job. Next item is you don't score the scoreboard and Carmen, as you can see, is coming. And then she's going to follow the truck. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Sorry, I'm short. Um, I'm Carmen Swanwick, uh, project development director, and I'm going to um, just give you um, our project delivery update for this month. So, um, going through where we are today, um, we have five past two projects. Uh, we have another 40 that are going to advertise within the next 60 days. But that is, all of these numbers are pretty on track for where we're at. Uh, the red past due are really, we're working through utility agreements and some right-of-way agreements. And that's uh, pretty standard for us in, in how um, we've been performing. Um, in a, since July, we've advertised 62 projects, uh, about $930 million. We've had a uh, some big projects with design builds coming through, so that's why that number is really high. Uh, and we're advertising 95% um, uh, on time. So um, I think performance on project delivery is um, going really well for us um, at this stage. <coughs> Moving down, um, in the last month even, we've advertised uh, 
300 and almost 74 million in projects. And again, that's pretty standard for us in our advertising performance. This time. This time again, yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Moving down into where we're at, uh, you can see um, on the dashboard the red are those projects that I stated earlier are really with the right of way and some utilities. Um, and I think as you can kind of see, I'll move this over just a bit. You can see we're really working on scoping and getting ready for next year in our uh, process. <laughs> Moving down into construction, we have 160 projects in construction right now. Very standard, you can see uh, our performance over the last year. And even in the last month, we've um, let 1. almost 6 uh, billion in contracts. Here's our contractor payments. You can see we've had, we've had a high in this last October. Um, we've had a pretty good fall, and so we've had a lot of work finishing up, and especially on some of our bigger design build projects. And now, finally, looking at um, our engineer's estimate um, with regards to what the projects have led at, and we seem to be in line with where we are in the industry right now with engineers estimates and what we're getting from this. So I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any. How do we look at the coming year as far as the inflationary pressures we're going to feel for our contracts generally? Do we have a way to look at that, Carmen? We do. So we keep um, a construction cost index and so we monitor all the prices with all the bid items throughout the year. Uh, we're kind of wrapping up this 2023 numbers right now, so that's in analysis, but we are finding that the inflation values have come down. Um, so I think we're more around that 6 to 8% than that 12 and 15 we were seeing in the past. I don't have all the final numbers yet, but that's what we're looking at right now. Thank you. That's helpful. Yes. Just put that in context, specifically when we look at projects that break the commission, Normally, in the five percent range, long term. So, this last couple of years have been stressful, and we've seen the results of projects coming back here with the land inside of the shop. So, this is the right trend. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other question? Good job, Carmen. Great. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Truly? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Oh, here we go. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about our zero fatalities strategic direction. I'll give you an update on where we are this time of year. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is you notice our, our, uh, our uh, fatality rate is uh, a lot lower. Getting back closer to what we've seen pre. Uh, pandemic, which we'll go through some numbers here and we'll kind of uh, be able to see why that, those, that number is coming down, which is a good thing. Um, but but uh, as with, we talk with the zero fatalities, when we start talking about the number of deaths here, it's never a uh, something we're, we're uh, patting ourselves on the back for uh, because there's still way, we're still on that road to zero and we're not, we're not, oh shit. Um, so let me scroll down here. Uh, today, if you look at, our, at, our, at the, our traffic fatalities for the year, we're sitting at 253 um, for, this, for this year. As we have. And I want to look at that at number at 253, and you can notice that um, we're, we've got this orange line, it's orange to me. Um, and, and we put that, that out there as our target, not a target that we, we want to reach. We want to be below that target every year, but we use that. I've, I've mentioned this before, but that. that Target is set by taking the the uh, three prior years and and averaging those and, and reducing that two and a half percent. You can see that we're below that um, that target, which that small successes in that. Um, but right now, uh, if you were to compare this to last year at this time, we were sitting at 292. 
So we're about 15% lower than we were last year. Um, and, and, and looking at that over the last five years, we're about 3% lower than our the last five years, if you have this amount, if you took the last five years, we're, we're about, about 3% lower than that. Um, with that 253, though, we do have um, our vulnerable user group. Uh, and I can and I say vulnerable users, and I'm always, I'm going to clarify pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorcyclists, I throw in that conversation. We have 87 of those this year of that 253, so roughly 34% of our fatalities on our roadways are, well, are classified in that. And uh, this, this year, so far, we've had 36 through um, this week. Um, now, I'm looking at that, I mentioned five-year average for fatalities. When you look at the number of pedestrian fatalities we have, we're actually, um, for this year, we're actually up. Uh, we had 30, through October, we had 32 uh, um, and I'm sorry, 32, yeah, we're actually at 35. So we've had another one this, this month. So we're actually, our pace is 9% lower than the five-year average for um, what, we're, what we've been seeing on pedestrians. So um, one thing about pedestrians too, I want to just want to mention, I had, we've been looking at some of the information, trying to figure out some more some, um, understanding what's going on in our system. Uh, this year we've had, uh, 27 of our pedestrian fatalities. Um, so I'm sorry, 70% of our pedestrian fatalities on state routes and the other 30% of them on the local routes. <clears throat> in 2023, we had, we, had, we had 36 head fatalities, 13 of them were intersection related, and 10 of those were in a legal crosswalk, and only seven of those were actually marked. So there's some, that's some data that we're, we're diving into or we understand maybe placement of that. Um, Sidewalks, are there other things we need to be doing to get better understand the data and what might be going on? But what we have, we can make improvements uh, on our system. Uh, bicyclists, I mentioned um, we have nine of those uh, this, this year, and that, that matches uh, that same, same um, at five year average is about where we are typically. Uh, we've been seeing it's, it's about right about nine in October, and then motorcycles, um, 42. We're right on. We're right on, on the same. So we're not seeing any improvement in, in reducing fatalities for motorcyclists and bicyclists. Can you say that motorcyclist number once again? So motorcyclists for this year is 42. Okay, so let me scroll down here for our serious suspected serious traffic injuries. Um, <coughs> 1,369. Serious injuries on our roadways. That is uh, roughly. You know, I've got. Uh, let's see. Let's see. We're about five percent higher than our target, which is thousand twenty nine, one thousand two hundred ninety four. That's that same target reduction that I mentioned earlier. Half percent average over the last three years to. Try and drop that thing. We're a little higher on that serious crashes. Um, and then on our total, total crashes, we're seeing a, a rather large increase in the number of just sheer volume of traffic crashes that we've seen this year. We're over 51,000 um, in the target for reduction of 42,000. <coughs> um, so that's that's kind of my that's my update from a, the score partner for our, our zero fatalities. Um, and right, step down, I was in. Go through my five reminders. Just wear a seatbelt. Try to focus, call, and alert. So, um, with that, if there's any questions? I just have one. Well, I'm, I'm interested in the pedestrian fatalities that involve uh, people who are experiencing homelessness. I don't know if we have the ability to look at that. Um, in, in the capital city, it's very common at this point for people experiencing homelessness to cross anywhere and not use crosswalks and different things. I don't know if anyone else here reflects on that. <clears throat> and I'm I'm hopeful that some of the changes happening in Salt Lake City and Salt Lake County will help with that. Um, dealing with unsanctioned camping and different things, all in the spirit of serving these people better. 
Um, and so if we don't have that data, I would love us to be able to track that and move forward. I don't know if that's a possibility. Uh, we are, we're actually looking at a, a lot more information in terms of pedestrians and in terms of like underserved areas or trying to get a better grip on what where things are happening. Um, there's a lot of that information. I'm not sure about if we have exactly would have that, but I'm sure there's um, a way for us to dive into that information. Yeah. And I've been very interested on it as well. I think it would be a very helpful data source to know if the new changes that are being implemented are working, because you know if we're having fewer pedestrian fatalities and people experiencing homelessness, it's one of the uh, signals that what we're doing is helping. Yes. And so that would just be an idea in the future to. And, and, and just to, to remind you to the commission, uh, Mayor Mendenhall, uh, Mayor Wilson, and Governor Cox have come together and united on a, a plan for homeless services that is really um, terrific, a breakthrough in in my mind of you know collaboration and cooperation. But they need our data help to know if their um, interventions are working. This is an area where you have to help. And I'm sure we'll take some, go back and see what we can actually mine from our sources to see if we can come up with something like that and give it beyond. Even one viewer is progress, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item number five on your agenda is on the six is consent agenda. The Ivan what my father is coming to you say that before. Okay. Good morning, Commissioner, Mr. Chair. My name is Ivan Pardo with Financial Programming. Um, today we have um, on item six is the consent agenda. Included in the consent agenda packet are the minutes for the September 21st meeting, the area tour meeting, as well as the September 22nd Transportation Commission meeting, as well as the list of projects that are either that we're proposing to re reduce funding. These, pro these projects have either been are in the closeout process have been a, or the funding's been available or, or made available to be removed and added to the program. Shown case here, and I will just click through the minutes that are available in the packet for review of the Thursday staff update meeting, the area tour that occurred around Duchesne City, as well as the Friday commission meeting itself. Yet, and the list of projects that are being proposed to be, have funds returned to the programs. Counting for a little, a little under $10.7 million being made available to the programs. Coming back to the top, our request, our request today is a motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented. So moved. Chair, thank you. It's a motion and a second. We have questions, questions. Yes. Just a comment. I wasn't able to attend in person last month, um, but reading through the minutes, particularly the, uh, the staff tour and update, uh, Heather, the minutes are just extraordinary. I felt like I was there except I didn't get to actually be at the break. So um, I just want to comment on how important that is, particularly if we're not able to attend. We really do get the information through your work. <laughs> so all in favor of this motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Next item. And then number seven is a programming item, 7A-1, SR 273, US 89 to I-15 is an addition of funding and scope. The scope of the SR 273 project is to remove and replace two inches of pavement on the roadway surface. After the pavement project was funded, it was identified that the structure that carries SR 273 over US 89 needs a deck, pothole patching, and a new microsurface. This request will add the scope and funding to the existing project. Located here on our map, Kaysville and Fruit Heights. Our request today is a motion to add scope and funding to the SR 273 US 89 to I 15 project as detailed. 
Should we make that motion? Please, thank you. I'll second it. There's a motion and a second. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 7A-1 is approved. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item, 7A-2, is a dual right-hand turn lanes on 650 North, the southbound I-15 project. The scope of this project is to add dual right turn lanes on 650 south to the south, 650 north, excuse me, to the southbound on ramps of I-15. This will about allow better utilization of the existing dual left turn lanes on SR-126. And Region 1 did a fairly strategic and great job showing the example of the issue that we're experiencing here, where we have a single a, a dual left-hand turn lanes, but only a single right-hand turn lane on the I-15. You can see all the all the cars being queued up. because they know, they know that that's the lane they need to be in. So this would change that, that traffic pattern. <clears throat> Our request today is a motion to approve adding the dual right turn lanes on 650 North to southbound I-15 project to the current status detail. I'll make a motion to approve that. Thank you. I second. There's a motion and a second. Any other questions, comments? We should have cost you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We have the Transportation Solutions Program. In my personal observation, the price has improved quite a bit compared to last month's. All in favor of this motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 7A-2 is approved. Thank you. Next item 7A-3 is a Cottonwood Canyons transportation study. This is an abandonment of a project. Um, this project was created to study the interaction of transit between Little Cottonwood Canyon and Big Cottonwood Canyon. The Little Cottonwood Canyon EIS and the Big Cottonwood Canyon environmental study cover the same scope. And after the completion of the Little Cottonwood Canyon EIS in 17.4, is no longer needed. The funding of this project will return to the Little Cottonwood Canyon EIS in 16 and 92. Well, that's a good question on this one. So, was there no work done on it? It was just sitting there? Correct. Yeah, that's right. Okay. I thought we finished the EIS, the Little Cottonwood Canyon. Why would somebody go back to that? Um, okay. Mr. Chairman, let's go ahead, that. please. Um, yes, we have issued the record decision, but we. Um, Still, may have some conversations if folks feel like they're going to challenge that. And so that's handled so, out of the EIS funding, yeah. not separately. Yes. How long can they have to challenge that? December 11th is the last day. That's the okay. And there have been challenges already? There has not been any legal challenges today. Yeah, you know, we have a second. Did we have any vote yet? I, no. Please oh, state your motion, please. Right. Where's, where's the state your motion, please. motion, please. Our request today is a motion to approve the abandonment of pin 17414 and returning the funding to pin 1609 to the state department. That's not just your motion. I like there hasn't been any work done, so there's not a sunk cost here. It's just it's just that there were other EISs taking place that took the place of this as yes. we return this money. And so I'll make the motion to approve it. Thank you. Awesome. There's a motion and a second. Any other questions, concerns? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 7A 3 is approved. Thank you. Our next item, 7A 4, is a funding addition from the High Volume Road Program, the US 89 Arizona. State line to Buck Creek Draw. The scope of the US 89 Arizona State Line to Buck King Draw project is a pavement and structures rehabilitation project with safety improvements on I US 89 from mile close to zero to 10. The project recently bid, and the department received two competitive bids with the asphalt bids coming in at 1.2 million higher than estimated. And I should say that with the asphalt portion of the bids coming in at 1.2 higher. 
The additional 1.4 will address the asphalt increase and related construction costs. Located here on our map, the Arizona State Line through Big Water. This is no, it's towards my page. Like Cal. I didn't know it's called what Trent Draw. I've heard it many times, but now I've learned what it's called. Yeah. 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 So our request today is a motion to approve adding funds to the US 89 Arizona State Line to Buck Tank Draw project. So moved. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item 7A 4 is approved. 7A 5, Technology Drive and 1300 South Bike Path. This is a scope and funding addition from the Region 4 CAT program, the Transportation Alternative Program. This is a joint highway committee project that Richfield City was awarded to extend a paved trail through Richfield City. The project will connect the trail on Main Street at 1300 South intersection. This trail is being constructed as part of the active transportation plan in Mitchell. The proposed funding addition is related to a project scope change to add a segment onto the trail along SR 120 between 1300 South and 1500 South. This scope addition would extend the trail to a retail area and a newly developed multi-building apartments complex. The extension will provide a safe location for all users in this area. Located here, on our map in Richville. And our request today is a motion to approve adding the scope and funds to Technology Drive and 1300 South Bike Path project as detailed. So moved, I'm filling these gaps that we talked about yesterday. I'll second. There's a motion and a second. What do they call that Technology Drive, Monty? Do you know? Do they have a technology complex there? In Monte Alder, you're reaching for Dragon. It's because of the Snow College. The okay. Technology. That makes sense. Okay, any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. We aye. We Snow College is in I thought it was an extension. Yeah. Any opposed? Item 7A 5 is approved. Thank you. Next item 7A 6 from the bridge formula program, Garfield County Bridge Replacement. There's three bridges, and it's a new project for the bridge formula program. At the April 29, 2022 Transportation Commission meeting, the commission approved the bridge list, a list of 90 bridges prioritized based on condition and load restrictions, eligible for funding from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. The bridge formula program. The following locally owned Gar Garfield County bridges are on the approved bridge formula program structures list. The Severe River Bridge on the north edge of Penguish, the Henryville Wash Culvert, and the Escalante River Bridge west of Escalante. The scope, the proposed scope of this project is to perform full bridge replacements on three bridge, the three structures listed above. The existing structures are currently in low fare or poor condition and are located off the federal aid highway system. Therefore, this project will not require a local agency match under the Bridge Formula Program. Garfield County has been notified of this effort and is in support of the project. Located here on our map, Anguish, Henryville, and West Quebec, Escalante. Including the packet is our, our pictures, the Sphere River Bridge, The Henry, the Henryville Wash Culvert and the Escalante River Bridge. Our request today is a motion to approve the Bridge Formula Program Garfield County Bridge Replacements 3 project as detailed. So moved. I'll second. There's a motion and a second. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 7A-6 is approved. Thank you. 7A-7 is Cottonwood Wash Bridge Replacement. This is a funding addition to this project. This project will re replace structure 0C301, which carries SR95 from Cottonwood Wash 
a mile close to 115 and a half in San Juan County, west of Landing. In August of 2021, a routine bridge inspection found this recent high water events had compromised the substructure elements of this bridge. This finding resulted in an emergency repair pin under pin a repair project or effort under pin 19715 and the subsequent creation of pin 19726, this pin here. To fully replace the, the structure at a future date, this pin is currently funded through the Federal Emergency Relief Program. The, these costs are primarily due to the location of the project site. In addition, the land adjacent to this bridge has unique cultural and environmental aspects to require approval from the BLM as well as Bear, Bear, Bears Ears Commission. This approval process added unforeseen time to the project schedule and increased overall design costs. This process will re also resulted in a change in scope, which added concrete gutters and retaining barriers to mitigate the impact of the project on these additional these adjacent cultural sites. So located here on our map, west of Landing, where we Cottonwood Wash. Some pictures of the structure. This was the emergency repair work that was done. Our request today is a motion to approve funding to the Cottonwood Wash Bridge replacement project as detailed. So moved. Thank you. Second. So motion and a second. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 7A 7 is approved. Thank you. Our next item 7A 8 is the Protect Resilience Improvement Planning. That's a funding addition. Um, the Information Investment Jobs Act established a new formula program called the Protect Formula Program to protect surface transportation assets by making them more resilient to current and future weather events and natural disasters, communities through resilience improvements and strategies and natural infrastructure. The Protect Program requires a set aside of at least 2% of the formula funding to be used for specific types of resilience-related planning activities, such as the development of the Resilience Improvement Plan, or the RIP, Resilience Project Prioritization, Resilience Planning, Pre-Design, or Design, Technical Capacity Prioritization, or Evacuation Preparation Planning. Upon FHWA acceptance of the RIP, the required non-federal match requirement is reduced by up to 10%. The RIP also helps meet the new IIJA requirement to address resilience in the Transportation Asset Management Plan or the TAM. The department is requesting approval to use the set aside of the 2024 through 2026 Protect Formula Program funds in development of the RIP, project prioritization, threat mapping, and other planning activities associated, associated with resilience planning. Our request today is a motion to approve adding funds to the Protect Resilience Improvement Planning Project as detailed. I'll make that motion. Thank you. Happy to second. Thank you. Any other questions? Long description of the plan. Yes. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 70 8 is approved. Thank you. 7A-9 is an information-only new project for the Salt Lake City's Reconnecting Community Study. It's a new pro it's a new project funded through the Re Reconnecting Communities Federal Grant. Also shown is the federal grant, the match from Salt Lake City and UTA. The scope of the Salt Lake City's Reconnecting Communities Planning Study is to analyze and prioritize solutions for east-west crossing along 6.1 miles of highly urbanized corridor. The solution will be focused on sustainable transportation modes, walking, biking, rolling, and transit. Transportation facilities proposed for the study are the intersections of the north-south I-15, rail corridor, and east-west crossings of 600 north, 200 south, 400 south, 800 south, 900 south for the nine-line nine trail, 1300 west south, 1700 south, and 2100 south. This study was recently awarded the $2 million from the Recon Reconnecting Communities pilot discretionary grant and will be funded with the required match from Salt Lake City and additional funds from UTA. This project has been approved by the Wasatch Front Regional Council and added to the Transportation Improvement Program. Hold on, question. Mr. Chair, yeah. um, I realize this is information only, but I'm really enthusiastic about this and I'm just reading into it, but I'm, I'm quite aware of the need for connectivity. 
between East and West, but particularly with the Big League Utah Major League Baseball proposal that in the power district has a lot of development coming and the need to connect that to the urban core. And this is the type of thing that will really help with that. Yeah. Think of an entertainment, sports, education, culture district that continues to make our capital city thrive and represent ourselves so well to the world, including the potential 2030, 2034 Olympic and Paralympics in the game. So this is the kind of thing that just really gets me excited. Good. Plus the rail crossings there can be such a problem. So that's, that's true. So that's federal money, the 1.97. Correct. That's great. That's great. Okay. Item number 10. Item 7A 10. Project combinations. These three, the six projects Region 4, Region 2, and then a statewide project. These individual projects have previously been approved through Commission for Action. Project combinations are done to provide efficiencies in project delivery. So, again, Region 4, Region 4 Cattle Guard, my 15 Cattle Guard, S, Region 2, SR35 improvements. And then our statewide applications program management project business systems modernization. Where we go with you. Never knew cattle guards were so expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and that is all I had today. Thank, Thank you. you, Ivan. Good Thank job. You. Item seven B capacity project. I can see that means I really jumping. It's so exciting. Is she kind of contain herself? It is exciting. Uh, <laughs> Good morning, Commissioners. Andrea Olson, Planning Director at UDOT. It is very exciting. This is the, the very first step in the Commission using your brand new uh, capacity project prioritization process. Um, what we are doing today, the, the first step is that, of that process is for the Commission to finalize the input lists that will go into those models for both the transit uh, project list and the highway project list. So as a reminder, we the projects that are automatically included on those lists are the projects that show up in phase one of the Utah Unified Transportation Plan. So all phase one projects for highway, all phase one projects for transit will be on that list. And the commission has the opportunity to add projects to either of those lists. So for the, on the highway side, you can add projects that have been identified as a phase one need um, or you can add projects that were nominated by a local government or a transit district. And then on the transit side, you can add projects that have been identified as a phase one need. Any transit project that's nominated that is eligible, we automatically add to the list. So after our discussion yesterday, um, we put together a proposed list of projects to be added to the highway input list. Uh, you can see that list of projects here. I believe it's 15 in total as it stands right now. Mm -hmm. And so what we are asking for today is a motion to approve the uh, additions to the list as presented. Mm -hmm. I have a, a question. Can we go back to the region one? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're looking at SR30, and we'd like to. We discussed moving, uh, widening the road from I-15, and I. Is that what is currently there? So this is the piece from, I'm gonna need help with state routes, from SR 38, I believe, to 23. That's correct. Am I getting those numbers right? And That's fine. I, I'd like to change that. I'd like to recommend that we widen that, we put on the list widening it as far as I-15. And, I'll, okay. and I'll, I'll just speak to that. Um, this is a primary corridor, uh, if we're widening part of it, uh, I, I would like, I would like us to have our priority be that we continue it on to Y15, so it opens the opportunity for that to become a major corridor coming off of Y15 through Box Elder County into Cache County, and uh, I think 
uh, Commissioner Van Tassel spoke to that yesterday and explained a lot of the reasoning for that. So uh, I would like to make a motion that we change that. Okay, so uh, can I ask a clarification question? Is that right? Mm -hmm. So you want to replace the project that's on here with the one to the west, or would you like to add the one to the west and keep this one on here so it's yeah, a continue? Add to the west. So add the, the segment to the west. And that has been identified as a phase one B. Yes. I believe it's uh, project number six on the um, phase one needs list. So we can absolutely yeah. add that. That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That addition, I would make a motion when we add these to the prioritization list once again, as you talked about yesterday and showed that here today. Great. So that's the motion. That's my motion. I'll, I'll second that motion. Okay. There's a motion and a second. I have to share something uh, funny with you, Andrea. After yesterday, when I came home and I reported to my wife who wasn't here, the meeting said what did you do i said well we did this and the main part was about commission and some projects to the list and they could all graciously accept it and she said did you ask race for the commission for the good job that they do <laughs> <laughs> i kind of pause and said, hey, i don't think that was part of the <laughs> So yeah, she was right. complimentary to the commission and the wonderful job you do. So we'll put, that on, we'll put that on the input list of this today. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, there's a motion and a second. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 7B is approved. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to give you a teaser for what's to come. Right now we anticipate at your December meeting that we will have ranked lists for all four project types, highway, transit, active transportation, and first class miles. So you can look forward to it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you all for your team. Starting yeah. from Ben, you, Andrea, and of course, Tiffany, everyone. Great thank job. Thank you. Okay. As you can see, Stephanie's already excited I'm too. I'm here. Yep. You are. <laughs> Number okay. seven, I see. Go ahead, Kate. Yes, good morning, Commissioner Stephanie Tonnelin, Trails Division Leader. Um, so we talked yesterday um, about the trail, Utah Trail Network, and we provided an update on where we are with the process of getting this new program off the ground. And I mentioned that today um, we'll be looking for approval of the Trails Division project evaluation process um, as outlined in the September uh, commission meeting. So that process is linked here. Um, so we're just looking for, um, today we're looking for a motion to approve this process, which outlines how the Trails Division will use the TIF active transportation or project prioritization model to rank projects for consideration with Utah Trail Network. So that is the description of the, today's motion. Number C. Any questions related to that? Mr. Chair, yes. I make a motion. Thank you. And I'll second it. So there's a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 7, I see, is approved. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. A big thanks to the trails team for the great work. Yes. Yes. You know, yes. They even did a little field study yesterday afternoon to make sure it was really working in St. George. <laughs> <laughs> All the stuff was on the trails, right? They're parked vehicles. All the bikes. They're suntans and they smile. Item number eight is true to 2024 internal audit projects. Hey, Shane, my friend. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. It's great to be with you. <laughs> Sorry. That is part of the audit. You have to be careful. <laughs> we need to check these microphones. We should add that to the list. So it's an auditor looking under everything. I uh, <laughs> just now that. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I hate to follow uh, Stephanie with such a great trail report, but uh, uh, it's my privilege and opportunity. Of course, I'm Shane Young, the internal audit director of UDOC. And every year I have a chance to present to you outcomes from our performance audits as well as uh, present to you the list of performance audits we'd like to focus on for the upcoming year. 
Uh, it's a comprehensive process in accordance with uh, Utah Code 72 1-206. The Utah Department of Transportation performs performance audits on a risk-based uh, process. So every year we go through a process of evaluating what our challenges are and uh, ways that we can help as uh, independent uh, analysts, you can call us, or whatever uh, name you want to call auditors, to see if we can improve processes, ensure that our uh, fiscal compliance and and oversight is doing what it's supposed to. So let me uh, see what we have first here. Heather, I might need your help knowing where to go. Thank you. Thank so, you. Mr. Chairman, while he's navigating. This, this goes back to 1996-97, when then Governor Levitt was negotiating with the legislature to raise the gas tax and basically commit general fund monies to build I-15 and 41 other projects as part of what was called the Centennial Highway Funds. The department was required to come up with $6 million of efficiencies every year. And they would report back to executive operations on that every year. And that became something that became more and more difficult and the statute was changed and it was required to do performance bonds. So essentially try to find ways to do that. So it goes back quite a bit of time, but it's been a really good process for us. Thank you. You received a copy of this prior to the meeting, which shows uh, eight projects that we like to propose for the upcoming year. There's actually one missing, I realized in reviewing this right before the meeting, of course. Uh, but I wanted to, first of all, ask you if you had any questions about the projects that are listed here. Selected those again. I mean, you, you did initially, but I mean, initially, how was that? Explain your process. Your process is your rest process. Well, we have this giant dark board. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It, well, it's not that <laughs> said. We, uh, we work with the senior leaders of each of the divisions and groups to, to assess what their concerns are, what type of vulnerabilities they're running into. Then we coordinate with our executive team to ask them what type of things would you, they would like us to focus on. And then we make a proposal based on our analysis, as well as discussions with our leaders, as well as various employees. So this year, for example, for our risk process, we surveyed uh, about 350 staff and asked them a variety of questions to help gauge, uh, to see if their risk concerns were aligned with the risk assessments we received from our senior leaders. And then these projects came up as a result from that process. And is that by order of priority? The most important thing we're concerned about is, so and it's just, I'm just curious as far as how you rank that. Uh, yeah, yes and no. The, we, we look internally at the resources that we have uh, within our capacity and then look at, you know, what can we work on first? But every time we have a project like this, the challenge with auditors is we just, we don't know what we don't know. And so we see a risk and we are trying to gauge the minds of experts who have really intrinsic knowledge in these particular areas. So yes, we'll go through the list one through eight, one through nine, but we'll according with every senior leader first, sorry. I. I'm usually not the staff of technology, but it really is fighting me today. And uh, we'll ask them as we scope a project to help us to determine what are the key areas that we ought to look at in more granular detail. And then um, oftentimes you'll see circumstances. I'll, I'll, for example, give you an update of our 2023 list where external reviewers or entities will go in and look at a similar item that we we're going to look at, and then we have to shift towards another project because mm -hmm. we don't want to be duplicative or really uh, innovate our folks with multiple audits. Well, I mean, these are all good, but I mean, four and five are not the brainers because we, we do so much contracting, so contractors and the public, you know, we want to know too, the public wants to make sure that there's a fair processing is so I think those are both, I mean, really, they're all good. But those two, as I looked at, this was really critical. We look at that. Yeah. No lapsing funds has been an issue um, as the legislature. I know this is something we were dealing with in higher ed, so it's interesting to see it talking there. Some of the institutions. Yeah, there was a new bill passed in 2023 that had performance requirements and metrics. Now we have to report to planning a budget as well as the legislative uh, fiscal analyst. That makes this a little bit more important to, to track. 
than before. The one project that's not on here, and I'll give you a revised list. So this is for your review today. And uh, it's uh, it's evaluating preliminary engineering estimates for projects. So as you can see how uh, you, you heard conversation today about estimates are aligned with actual expenses. Uh, we're curious to see what type of uh, items are in those estimates and see if there's any opportunity opportunities for us to see additional trends or areas that you got, should be concerned with as prices continue to escalate. We, every commission meeting, we talk a little bit about the impact of inflation and supply and demand. And so you'll see a line item for that. It actually shows up as number two in between one and two, but that's the only change that I realized wasn't here. Okay. Uh, I'll just give you a, a, to, to your previous question about how do we organize these and prioritize them. Uh, so we are well underway with the performance audits that you all approved in 2023. And so um, I'll just give you a brief update of two projects that we're, we're not working on uh, because they've already been done externally. So stormwater compliance number three was a performance audit that was scheduled last year. Uh, UDOT recently went through an EPA audit, which uh, comprehensively went through the stormwater process. And so we coordinated with our, our folks who are responsible for stormwater and decided that maybe they wouldn't be very welcome to us uh, coming back and doing a duplicative audit of what was already done. And then uh, the other one is sub recipient monitor monitoring. There was also an FTA audit a couple of years ago that's being followed up on now with our world transit team. And we're waiting to see what the outcomes are from the uh, the, the resolutions and, and, and the feedback of FTA before we dive in and see how we can help in this area. All of the other reports, however, we're looking forward to reporting on. In fact, uh, next month I have uh, our right away audit from the prior year that I'll present in December. And uh, I guess I should follow up by saying, since this is for your review, if there are any projects that you would like us to work on or you feel requires priority, then you, this, this is the time or uh, in between this review presentation and then the approval the next commission meeting to let us know if there's something that's on your mind we would love to make sure that we're able to focus on that uh, Mr. Chair, just to understand that so the idea would be if there's a UDOT project that we think needs a closer look from an auditing perspective to just make you aware and mm -hmm. take that into consideration yeah you, you can contact me and then we can prioritize it and uh, make sure that we take care of it and for the commission uh, information, I sit on the audit advisory committee with Shay and Carlos, so we raise this again in detail. So it's kind of like um, two, three eyes looking into it. Okay. I appreciate this work. So this was for information only. This is for information only. Okay. Thank you. Good job. Uh, the next one is actually one of the performance audits that we completed last year, which is on our quality workforce. So in our risk assessments for the last three years, uh, workforce demands and workforce, workforce challenges rose as the number one risk that we found in all of our assessments. Therefore, this was one of the areas that we delve in deeper. And uh, what we wanted to do is provide UDOC with an independent look from our own analysis, our own investigation through the resources to see if a lot of the risks that we've heard about the struggles of retaining a quality workforce and the challenges of trying to maintain adequate staff to perform UDOT responsibilities was indeed accurate. And um, I, it, it's a seven page report. I think you've had a chance to look at it, but I'll just give you a brief summation of what we found that were the relevant details and I'll answer any questions on this particular performance audit. Uh, I would say the general summary that we would provide is that uh, is right here in sentence one of the summary. Workforce and demand for transportation solutions generally outpaces the available workforce, yet UDOT continues to deliver projects and services. And so we looked at three primary areas. One is uh, where we have the biggest staff constraints, and that's within our maintenance groups, within our engineering pool, and then the dynamics of the way we work with consultants and contractors. So I'll just I'll, I'll gear you towards a couple of these statistics that I think are are relevant and and probably congruent with what you have heard 
out of this meeting as well as uh, with folks here. So this table one is a, a series of graphs that illustrates, uh, well, there's a lot of information here, so let me try not to digest it and, uh, and regurgitate all at once. So Utah staffing numbers uh, throughout the years, we evaluated several different uh, data points, for example, how, how much, how big has Utah become in terms of staffing over the last 10 years? And you notice that our numbers stayed relatively consistent from 2012 to 2022. We went from uh, roughly 1,600 employees to about 1,700 employees. Uh, positions with the most vacancies, it's no surprise that primarily in areas of maintenance, as well as our uh, entry-level engineering fields is where we have the highest amount of uh, staff turnover or staff demand. And then on the bottom corner, this is a, in a very interesting graph because it shows here our staff, our UDOT staff is a yellow line, but then you see the active stiff projects as the red line, and then the projects designated are active in our system for construction. So this is our EPM system saying these are all the projects that are actively going on. You can see the staff line stays relatively constant, but there is an increase in the workload that's being placed upon them. Uh, this, this was really for the engineers because they always ask a question like this, well, how many FTs do we have for something else? So we, we looked at how many FTs does you don't have per 1,000 residents? How many FTs do we have per 1,000 lane miles? And we compared it to a statistic uh, from AASHTO that did a comparable study. We find that Utah, it runs very, very little compared to our neighbors. 4.6 4 employees for every 1,000 residents, or uh, 10 employees for every 100 lane miles. Uh, if you look at the composition of UDOT employees too, it's changing. So um, over half of UDOT employees right now have less than 10 years of experience. That's that's our rising workforce at UDOT uh, from our, our viewpoint in, in our analysis. And then the average year spent at uh, UDOT is roughly four years in comparison to other state DOTs where the averages are closer to nine to 10. We, uh, I'm gonna move on here. Um, when we look at one of the recommendations we have is uh, wage barriers, uh, that, that seems to be the biggest issue in maintaining maintenance staff, for example. At the time we did this review, uh, we looked at the average salaries, for example, of our transportation technicians and they rank either second to last or last at um, for the state but uh, the challenging part about working for the state is there's been such an increase in uh, people who have moved into the state over the last few years and um, more and more roads are being constructed that, that equals more maintenance and um, this is uh, table five also shows additional statistics about how UDOT work has increased from an engineering perspective. So if you look at the bottom two graphs here, I think this is really fascinating because if you look at 2020, 2020 was during the time of the pandemic, and you would expect that our workload would have decreased our projects, but it actually did the opposite. Uh, work, workload increased exponentially from 2020 even to the present time. Uh, yet our staffing numbers have maintained, you know, have stayed generally the same. And then you can see the funding increases uh, here of uh, how much projects are costing. So hence, when you see the audit schedule for 2024, that's why there's so many projects related to how do we uh, how do we look at costs and how do we look at you know what the expenses for building roads and multimodal opportunities. Um, so generally, our recommendations are that you should continue to monitor wage gaps and uh, look for opportunities to retain staff. Uh, there are some data points that uh, we have in systems that uh, if, if we enhance it, could give us a better picture of, of what our staffing compensation looks like. And um, we felt that this uh, audit is reflective and representative of the risk that we found in the risk assessment, that there, there is indeed continual constraints when it comes to retaining qualified and, and skilled uh, labor force at the DOT. Any questions I can answer for you on this audit report? Just a comment that I'd have. I look forward to seeing what you finalize and come up with. I think as a commission, as we look at UDOT, we've done amazing things with human people. 
I think we're going to get to that premises where we end up having, we're going to start hurting ourselves. I think we've got to be somewhat respectful of making sure we have sufficient staff, compensation, maintain what we've got. Just as good roads are cheap as good employees as far as they trained or cheap as they keep. I couldn't agree more. And when I mean, employees from all parts of the state of Utah here, and the Utah folks are great. So we need to just do what we can to make it a place that they want to continue to prosper. This is very helpful. Well, this, this is not publicly available. Uh, it is publicly it's available. Yeah. It's, it's not on a website, is what I guess I mean. It is on a website, too. Okay, so I can see you're curious. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a really great presentation, and that information is golden. Um, Carlos, it makes me wonder why we're not doing this for every state agency. So I'd love you to make that point at cabinet. Because <laughs> that, I mean, that's terrific information. And I know that the deal is that UDOT is, you know, in state government terms, a well funded entity. And there's an obligation to come to that funding to conduct yourself in the way that UDOT has and does, and this bears that out. So really terrific. Um, I worry about the workforce, I'm sure my, all of the commissioners do, and I'm mindful of the what I'll call the tier one cliff. We're right, but we're right. And I, don't, uh, I don't know. If, yeah, you would say it better than I could. Well, no, no, it's. Um, you know, I've uh, probably. I've always referred to it as the golden handcuffs. So back in the uh, in 2010, 2011, and I've got good friends here that were in the legislature who I believe did the right thing, but we, we essentially lost that tier one pension in 2012. And at that time I said, well, that's, you know, when an employee starts with the department, um, that first 10 years, you're not thinking pension, you're thinking, you know, buy a house, take care of a young family. And it's really after about 10 years where you start to say, oh my goodness, I understand what that pension is. And um, then we're going to start to sit, have a hard time pulling on with people because we've created a much more, and this is true, I think, in every business, much more mobile workers. And, you know, I was sitting in the committee in the back room and the commitment was, yes, but we're going to keep up with the market. And I knew that was impossible. So we can never keep up with the market and government. We can't respond fast enough. And so, yes, we are starting to experience that you know, tier one cliff. And it's going to continue to, you know, it's not going to change. And so you know, I'll, just, I'll just say that, you know, the numbers that you saw from Shane are internal. But this is not, you know, we, we outsource more than any other DOT in in terms of our design work and our construction. It's the only way we can do it. If you look at those numbers, it's the only way we can do it. 93, 94% of our design houses. Construction engineering, where we have probably covered 63, 64% is outsourced. And the challenge we have there is the owner, the state, the DOT, has to be making those decisions. And then our private sector partners are technically experts but they have a really hard time operating in the gray and making those decisions. So we've been trying to focus on what we call core capacity and making sure that we have folks that can help make those decisions um, so that the, con the contracts can move forward. Nothing frustrates a contractor more as you're out there, you've got equipment money, you need a decision, and we have a consultant. Um, resident engineer out there who's like looking at the specs and like, well, I don't know. Because what if the owner doesn't have my back? And so the consultants are experiencing work shortages. Some of the projects, especially program, a ton of projects, we're metering those projects because there's not enough capacity in the different technical areas. There's not enough people that can do work. You dealt with an issue on a project a little while ago when we had one bid, $20 million over the engine estimate. No competition. Without competition, we do not. You know, we don't get fair price. And so this is an industry-wide problem. Every DOT in the country is facing this challenge right now. And, and that statement that over half of the workforce is less than 10 years, that's not 
the right ratio for us. And if you talk to Robert Stewart, Region 2, the urban areas, would you say, Robert, your average tenure of your trend, your maintenance folks, one and a half years? Four years. <laughs> That's that's medium. Okay. Okay. Fifty percent. So, my kid So, seeing this makes me understand why the things you and Lisa and others have done recently to recommend and do some adjustments are so critical. Because uh, you see this, this you got to be doing that. So that's Bravo that we're at least making attempts where we can to try to to support this to manage this. Yeah. And you know, I know, I know, um, Nani was able to attend a portion of the annual conference where I spoke. I spoke about the stress and managing it because our folks are feeling it. And you know, they're pretty proud. But there's a lot of stress on these people. May I just reiterate how fun that annual conference was as well. And there were a lot of our alums there because there's such good relationships between current employees. But there's also, I'm sure, some recruiting going on too. So I know <laughs> kudos for bringing that together, Carlos, and such a with UTA and the other agencies. So. Can't put stuff on guilty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I respect all their decisions. <laughs> respect your fun. Oh, no, that hurt. <laughs> I'll just finish by saying that if you have any individual questions about this report, I know it's a lot to digest in a short meeting like this. Uh, you're welcome to reach out to me, and uh, we have lots of backup documentation can, that can elaborate further. And uh, my last, my final comment on it would be that uh, while we did this report, there's been uh, tremendous efforts from UDOT to evaluate and look at how we can retain and help our employees that are here. So it was uh, impressive that uh, the information that we provided was uh, was was being looked at seriously and and work is being done. So thank you. Thank you, Shane. Very well. So well, it's going to be required of us to help solve this problem. What we're doing is we're focusing on the things we can control. So we, we, we can work on culture. So we have a big emphasis internally on wanting to you know, to be the place where people want to be. And we want to make it a place where we respect their priorities and their personal time. And so we provide the flexibility that we can. So we're trying to, that is our major focus in this area. Realizing, you know, compensation is a line item transfer out of your pocket goes out of the construction budget and it goes to the different line items that fund our employees and that is a very interesting process because you know when we look at this from a state level the um, the governor's office always has a hard time saying this one agency is different than this agency and we're going to treat it differently we created our competition because other state agencies don't outsource. So our competition are our partners. And we've created a, you know, a very large field of people that we compete against for great people. And so that's a, we, we made this problem. And so we're just gonna have to, I think, Commissioner, I can't advocate here in front of you for salary increases because the data goes from the Department of Government Operations to the governor's office, who then puts together a recommendation and it goes to the legislature, and the legislature will look at compensation right at the end, right? Right at the end, once you go through all your appropriations processes, you kind of look and see what's left. And then you look at every state employee, all the state agencies, and be fair to all the state agencies. So, was that political enough, oh, yeah. Commissioner? Yeah. He called me a politician earlier, so. <laughs> <laughs> it was sensitive. May I just say that one of our really good employees in my private company has joined UDOT, and yes, I saw the company that she's loving the, the culture and the leadership opportunities that you provide to her. That's, you know, we thought we'd be okay with her, and she's excellent. But it was a good move for her, for her career. Go to you, Doctor. 
private sector. So we're gonna we're gonna try to be the place where people want to be, not that they have to be. Um, so one uh, data item that I think would be interesting. Your comment I find really compelling about um, you know we moved to a um, a different retirement system, but we're going to keep up with competitive wages. So we'd be interesting to take that time frame and look at what wages have done, you know, within state agencies. We went four years with nothing. Yeah. Anyway, that would be, I really think it would be compelling because um, if there's one thing that's capital intensive, it's government. Sorry, it's human capital intensive, it's right. government. Right. That ongoing cost. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. if we can help, let us know. Thank you. Oh, sure. Are policymakers open to this discussion? Is this I, I've, I've had wonderful conversations with leadership in both bodies over the last couple of years, and they have provided some flexibility for the organization. So we've been able to make some small um, improvements, but yes, uh, they're open. Do you think I, the government office do a study last year and showed how far behind we had gotten with the state? Like, we're 14 percent behind market. Yeah, and that's general. I mean, when you know, for us, take our engineers. For yeah, instance, no, I got the numbers um, it's it's much much bigger. But they when they do their data, they're looking at all engineering across the entire state. And we look at our data. We know exactly what we're paying. We know the exact salaries, and those are the people. It's the people. We're not competing with an engineering development, engineering land developments, or you know, so. It's it's we've had, had some interesting conversations about you know what are the appropriate comps to look at. Well, thank you, you that family, for being so generously unselfish. Thank you. Item number nine is administrative rules, and Dave Elder he is anxious with his water bottle and the computer <laughs> to come yeah. forward. <laughs> Leif Elder, uh, the Legislative Affairs and Policy Director at UDON. Uh, Peter Asplund's going to come up for one of these. Uh, it seems unfair that I have five and he has one. Uh, Peter helped on all of these. But, uh, okay, so starting off. Uh, Rule 909-1, safety regulations for motor carriers. Um, this is an existing department rule. Okay. Um, and um, we're, we're on these department rules, we're providing awareness to you that we're changing something, giving you an opportunity to give us feedback, which, which we really appreciate if, if you have the, uh, feedback. Um, but no commission action is needed on, on the department rules. Okay. Um, this, this rule is being amended uh, for two reasons. Uh, to conform with changes made by the legislature to the definition of intrastate commercial vehicle. Uh, previously, we had uh, this definition basically regurgitated statute in our rule. And we've gone away from that. And so now we've uh, stricken a bunch of language there. Say, let's just refer to the statute. So when the statute changes, our rule uh, will be in lockstep with those changes. Uh, the other reason for the change, uh, for uh, some changes here, is to update references to the Code of Federal Regulations, uh, which was uh, recently changed. So you can see that there in red. Uh, that is the presentation on that rule. If you have any questions, fairly uh, straightforward on that. So. so we'll be approving these next. Um, so this is a department rule, no approval necessary. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this is a another department rule. So also no approval necessary, but just uh, providing awareness and, and definitely appreciate uh, uh, your feedback from from your perspective as, as commissioners um, so this rule uh, is being changed for um, really two two reasons 
First of all, we're making clarifications to facilitate the administration of and compliance with uh, the rule. And these clarifications include uh, two things. So we're changing the definition of the of a drop fee. So when you're towing, uh, and, and it's what we call a non-consent tow, when a person comes up and, and they're in the middle of being towed, uh, under certain circumstances, the tower can still charge a drop fee uh, to release the vehicle. If they haven't really done anything, then of course you can just take your car and go and you count yourself very lucky that day that you don't have to pay uh, to get your car back or, or, or whatnot. But this makes clarification to the definition of a drop fee so it's more clear when those can be charged. Okay. Um, it also uh, requires charges related to a consent tow. So sometimes you have non-consent tow and consent tow charges all together. This requires those to be on separate receipts so that it's clear, hey, here's what you've consented to, the services you consented to, and here's what we did because you were in the wrong place at the wrong time and, and, and so forth. So those are on separate receipts. Um, so then the second reason we're making changes here is to require annual indexing of storage fees. Uh, per the current rule, UDOT already uh, indexes the other two primary tow fees. So there's the actual tow service fee, and then there's an administrative service fee, uh, which is charged uh, basically so they can recoup some costs for the being regulated by the state. And we require them to make certain reports and, and do paperwork, and so it's an administrative fee. Those two fees are indexed. Um, and so this was a discussion had uh, with the Motor Carrier Advisory Board. Uh, Senator Ibsen, who was uh, here uh, previously, he chairs that board, and they made the re recommendation that towers came to him and said, hey, can we increase this? And we kind of looked at it and like, well, we haven't increased these other fees and realized, oh, that's because we index them. And so these would also be indexed similar to those other fees. So that uh, is the changes that you would see as we go through uh, the rule here. Um, you can see the definition for a drop fee. And there's several clarifying changes in here just to kind of uh, get in lockstep with the rule writing manual. It's an over 100 page document that says, first how you write a rule. So we've made some changes to uh, make sure we're in harmony with that. But, um, anyway, this is uh, one of our longer rules, but uh, any questions or things I can answer on that one? Who had those complaints about tow companies? <laughs> Every year. Yeah. No, who who else, which, which part of government has to respond to that? So, uh, UDOT, uh, our motor carrier division, uh, is the one who gets those complaints. If you guys know Chad Shepik, uh -huh. our motor carrier division director, and Carlos may have something down here. So Chad sits and reports to Troy Peterson. Yes. Yeah. 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 Now that's a tough job. No. Um, and it's the reason we're changing the drop fee is from those complaints on both sides, both the towers and, and the uh, those being towed. Um, so it's it's a it's a tough thing. I mean, property rights are yeah. uh, are important, and yeah, you got to balance it. You got to balance it. So okay, I'll move on to this uh, next one. This is uh, this is a new department rule. So department rules. So uh, providing awareness to you. Uh, no commission action is needed. Um, this rule is required by uh, SB 24 from the 2023 general session. It requires UDOT to make rules for registering uh, drones and, and similar type uh, aircraft that are used for commercial operations. So if you have drones yourself and enjoy to fly them for recreation purposes, this isn't for that. Uh, you can you can continue to do that without registration. Um, 
So a couple of things uh, about this. Uh, there's some FAA uh, kind of preemption issues here where you know we're not allowed to, to regulate uh, this industry uh, at, at some levels. So this is being administered as a fee in lieu of property taxes. You'll see in the rule that it says, hey, if you're subject, if your drone is subject to property taxes under, under Utah code, uh, then you do not have to register. If you're not subject to property taxes, then you would have to register. So it's kind of a, a uh, and it, it follows the system what we currently do with our large aircraft. That's how they're registered. If they're assessed property tax, they don't have to pay the registration. If they do uh, uh, not pay a property tax, then they are registered. And, and that goes into our aeronautics restricted account uh, for uh, infrastructure for the industry. So. Um, like, is the price the same? A registration fee versus a versus the property tax. Um, I would say there is not an effort to make that the same. There is potential legislation this session that would just fully exempt drones from property taxes, so it would be just one system for everybody here. And we're just working through those issues because it, it is new. So, like, who will em, you know enforce this? That is a great question, and we've looked at that. It is not something that's easy to enforce. With with the, the large aircraft, we have ability there because airports have lists of what planes are there, right? So we can get a list from them and and go down the, the list and say, oh, okay, yeah, we already know uh, Delta. That's a Delta plane. They pay property taxes here. They're centrally assessed by the tax commission. Oh, that's a charter carrier. They're not centrally assessed. So yes, we need to send them a letter. So we have in the rule the ability to send out a letter to say, hey, you might, we think you might own a drone that is subject to this. Uh, so that's one way we're gonna do that. We're gonna be learning. Uh, because this is the beginning. You might have a good idea of those. Use, look like. I'm, I'm just thinking there are some small businesses in recreation communities, you know, photography businesses who uh, I've noticed lately they're using drones to produce some of their photography. And I'm just yep. thinking about that business may not even be registered in as a registered business. And, yeah. and so this just really opens an interesting door to how do you enforce this? And this looks <laughs> Really interesting to me. Yeah, I love them. Yeah, we don't have any answers to a lot of this. It's all be so fast, but you know, I think the image that most people have is this is the Amazon delivery. Okay, you so know, it's it's a larger corporate. That thing. that was, I think, the image that people have, thinking that now this needs to have some type of oversight and some way of better understanding what's going on out there. So this is a baby step into this. Senator Harper has been trying to figure out how to where we should be. Well, this will be an interesting one to follow. Yeah, and maybe to Carlos's point there, it, it is envisioned for those who are kind of using what maybe in the future will be termed as the highways in the sky. Somebody who's doing photography probably is not had a, a route that they're using every day, like, like a, a zip line that's delivering uh, medications to people via drone or or, or, or these other folks uh, that are Chick doing package starter too. Yes. And <laughs> really? uh, they, let's get on our phone. Sometimes you just need to ask. These these registration fees, uh, I think there's gonna be legislation this year that would direct those to a, a restricted account that's for advanced air mobility uh, drone type infrastructure so the money would, would go into the system uh, for their benefit. So, um, so that's what we have on that rule. Appreciate the discussion and the questions. Do you want to do an ENF uh, before we just give the last one to Peter? Uh, sure. Oh, yeah, sure. I'll do that. Um, so. Okay, so uh, R940 dash. 11 guidelines for partnering with local governments um, so just the this explanation here i hope i uh, 
help you understand and not confuse you here. This would be a, a new commission rule, okay? But it, it's really an existing department rule that we're uh, converting to a commission rule and then modifying. And let me explain uh, why uh, we're doing that. So first, the rule change is required by 2023 legislation, okay? Uh, but in the process of making the rule change, we noticed that the statute requires the commission, not the department, to have the rule. And so, uh, oh, well, we better convert that to a department rule. And I, I did a little bit of research. Looks like this rule came online maybe in 2004. And my hunch is we didn't really have commission rules at that time. And so we just did it as a department rule. But now we have uh, our own set of R940s, which are the commission rules, so we'll convert it to a commission rule so that it's clear that uh, it's yours. So as the as the statute uh, states. So we'll definitely want to raise that. Yes, uh, another rule. Uh, boy, that that well, yeah. you have to do. Oh, well, for me as well. So I, I'm I'm off there. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just with local governments, not with private sector, not with other. Entities, right? It's just with local governments. Um, uh, so yes, so this is partnering with local governments. Uh, it's an existing rule that allows partnering with local governments to do state highway projects. And normally it would be the local government. Uh, and Elm, I guess I should make clear that this is a fairly seldom used rule, especially now that we have the robust nomination process that you guys have talked about earlier with Andrea. Uh, before that came online, there was kind of this, uh, where a local government could come to the commission and say, hey, uh, you haven't prioritized this particular project yet, but if we contributed a million dollars or five million dollars on this project, would that entice you to, to move that up? Would, would that be worth it to you? It's, and this is kind of me talking and how I see this rule, but but it's kind of a, an opportunity for local governments to come to the commission and say, hey, if we partner with you on this, would you consider doing it? Um, so the existing rule uh, lays out the process for handling those requests. And the current rule uh, says that the commission can consider local matching dollars. Uh, so that was kind of the scenario I mentioned, hey, a million dollars, five million dollars, this, uh, the legislation that passed asked the commission to kind of expand that uh, to, con to include considering uh, future local revenue dollars uh, that are generated because of the project. And so that it's just kind of a tweak to add a, an additional consideration there uh, for that. So that's uh, what that rule is about. The other changes, there are a few other changes. They're just for clarity and conformance with the rule writing manual. Um, this particular rule, uh, we're not asking for action today, but we'd bring it to a future meeting uh, to, to approve. So, any questions on that one? Okay, my last one. Uh, so, this is the uh, R940-6, um, this is the existing commission rule that sets forth the uh, process for prioritizing to highway projects, to active projects, uh, to active transportation projects, uh, TTIF transit projects, and TTIF first and last mile projects. Okay, so you, you uh, saw this uh you talked about this process back in august and and in the meeting prior to that um and we are uh, recommending action on this to approve the department forwarding this rule to the office of administrative rules for further consideration uh the primary changes as i mentioned were already approved by the commission at its august meeting when it approved the changes to the prioritization uh, process document uh, because that document is incorporated by this rule, the commission now has to go through the rule making process to uh, make that official. Okay. Um, and 
since we have to go through the rulemaking process on this rule, it's, it's also a good time to, to make uh, clarifications and, and clean up the rule a little bit, make it conform again with the rule writing manual. Um, and the reason why I keep bringing that up, by the way, is there was an executive order uh, last year or something like last year or two years ago saying, hey, agencies, we want you to conform with this manual. So that's, that's why we're always looking at that. Um, so the uh, additional changes include modifying the web address for the prioritization document that you approved in August, uh, clarifying the capacity, uh, what capacity means when it comes to a TTIF transit project. This time when we had nominations for TTIF projects, there was a little bit of, well, uh, we had, uh, for example, a project that was for charging equipment. And can, you know, that's not really a capacity project, it's the kind of rule. And so we're clarifying in the in the rule to make sure that that's uh, clear. Also, harmonizing matching requirements with recently passed legislation. Uh, there was a 40% requirement for TTIF and last mile projects, and that just moved down to 30%. Uh, so we fixed that. Updating rule language dealing with projects that are included on the input list uh, to be consistent with current practices. You had Andrea. Uh, who's the expert in this? She read through the rule and said, ah, "This is a little bit different than what we're doing." They're just, but they're just small clarifications to make sure what we're saying is actually what we're doing. So, uh, nothing, nothing major on that front, but just little clarifications. Um, also, for our TIF active transportation projects, we added a, a, a few requirements that we felt like uh, are necessary, and that was to. Uh, include a reasonable cost estimate uh, as, as well as reasoning behind the estimate and then a plan if you go over that estimate what are you going to do uh, with, with that project to make sure it's complete and so forth and then we also update language to conform with the rule writing manual as i mentioned uh, again the the Substantive changes really already approved by the commission in August, and that's why we're asking for action at this meeting. Um, but of course, any action you take is, is up to you. So uh, that's my presentation on that. If you have any questions, happy to answer them. Thank you. Good job. Okay. I hope you get time to have some kind of novel reading rather than all the rule reading. <laughs> This is Thank you. Last one up takes out the trash rule here. <laughs> um, so this is rule 918.4, using volunteers and third-party contractors for litter control. If you, uh, if we go to the actual rule. You'll notice that the entire rule has underlined, so it's all new language, but it's actually not a new rule. Uh, but the old rule kind of was so confusing and well, or was so repetitive and everything that we're repealing and reenacting the rule. But the main thing that brought this rule to the forefront, and so it's it's been like a, a year on this rule, really, because we've gotten rid of the adopt a highway program, which was where individuals and groups could take a segment and get a sign. But much like if, if you were at the Transportation Interim Committee, uh, a legislator brought up a bill on uh, personalized license plates, and that's facing the same problem, that once the government creates a vehicle for speech, it has First Amendment protection, but all the signs that go up front of the highway may not be the ones that the state of Utah or Utah would want to endorse. And it, it, eventually not worth the trouble but if that makes sense so but we still really value so many groups and everything that are willing to volunteer and pick up litter and so we've written this rule in a general way for the 
volunteer groups, um, and we haven't named that program, it'll probably be something like Keep Utah Beautiful or something like that, but we're not gonna put it in the rule. That way we can change the branding when we need to. Uh, so that's the one that, and we've also created, if you read through the rule, I think it, it it's pretty clear that you go online and everything. The reason we have a rule is because whenever we want to uh, require third outside people outside of UDOT to do something, we need a rule to do it. We can't do that with a policy. And we want to make sure volunteers are safe, that, that they're going to their assigned place to pick up the litter. And we also uh, have a website that's already uh, started working as a test, but where everybody can go sign up uh, to go do litter clean up with their groups it'll last a year you know you can sign all the waivers and everything uh, just so you know the there's also an existing program called the sponsor a highway program and it's such a similar name it can be confusing but that's a third party company and others could do it too but there's currently one company doing it they get uh, businesses to pay them money to sponsor a highway where they get assigned, and then this company does the cleanup on the highway. We've kept that one with the signage because it's a little more easy to control <laughs> because it's one third party working with it and it has to be the name of the business and, and things like that. We'll still watch it. But anyway, that, uh, so this rule, we're going, to, this one is just for information, but this one's going to, go into place and then our policies and the website will be finalized and everything hopefully about the early spring when when the new season of litter cleanup uh, starts. I guess down here, maybe people can go all year round, but uh, for the urban and northern parts of Utah, that, that season's ended <laughs> for now and we're gonna get it on place. Uh, uh, if any of you have any questions, happy to answer them. Senator Van Ness had a comment about cleaning up the new uh, highways. I mean, the uh, trails, yeah, local volunteers too. So, will this tie into that? Can it? Well, that's good. That's good. Uh, it's a good. Um, it's usually you know, roadway is how it's currently written. Uh, I, I think that's worth considering. Uh, if we eventually want to rule or some come up with some similar system obviously the big thing about roadways is the safety concerns of people picking up the sure, trails are pretty wicked too yeah, no no no, no that's true you may need even brighter vests or something <laughs> if it's I mean, that's in the right track that's a great question i mean peter would let's look and maybe see uh do we say roadway, you dot roadway yeah. trail? Yeah, that, well, I think that's worth looking yeah. at, seeing yeah. if we can figure out a way to, to help us at all in a good way. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Well, credit to our distinguished senator. Mm -hmm. That's all we need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Mm -hmm. Next item on the agenda is a uh, commission committee report. So I'm going to start with the commission member, please. Um, there are uh, some committees are meeting in Cache Valley in regard to transportation there at the CMPO meeting as well as a study meeting on uh, US 89 and that's going well. That's uh, Cache Valley stays in challenging growth and we've also had some very positive meetings in small, smaller rural areas, Rich County, Fox Elder County that are encouraging where we're engaging people in a broader discussion about roads there. So it's been very positive and I appreciate the UDOT staff attending those meetings and the trails meeting. I know I said something last month, but I just have to say how positive that is for recreation community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll just mention the state's new population estimates for 2023 will go public in the first week of December and I'll report at them at our meeting. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, probably just to know we've had uh, we've been able to attend represent the commission on three HTR, HTRZ zone meetings and they've been good. It's been Summit County, Salt Lake, and we did a late night this week and I've enjoyed that. And 
people wanted to do high density around those, they come to the committee to see this in tax incentives. So it's been good. You go to those. And we'll keep going. That's great. We did not have a quarter preservation meeting this last month, but we did. Uh, the auction for 19 parcels is live now, and that's been a, a big success. We've had former reports from Charles Stormont about it, but it's a nice opportunity to read the surplus property back into the public, uh, private hands, the public domain, and uh, use that money for our projects going forward. So we look forward to some more of that going with our new um, Ross Crow. Yes, uh, we met him at the transportation conference. It's a great addition, I'm sure. So thank you. One, one final thing. I just have to say how appreciative I, I am for the support. You know, my name is on the website, so I get calls, and it, it's just so interesting. And I look at particularly my friend Eric. He, he probably won't pick up the phone for me again. I Eric Grasby, right. just because so many of them seem to be in the uh, street, but it's so helpful. I um, I think Kevin Kitchen may have left already, but he even accepted an uh, invitation to speak at a rotary meeting in Salina out of the blue. And I just thought, above and beyond the call, money. So thank you again for that support. It's just an honor to be a part of this and to see that, that we have so many dedicated employees that answer the call and make uh, this this great state that it is. Thank you. Um, I have nothing relative to my committee assignment, uh, but I do like to, um, it was my first time attending the transportation conference, and I walked in, and Cameron was like, hey, we can move forward on that roundabout because some money freed up, and then Jared had to go to city council, and um, I disagree. Jared's never going to answer a call for me, so um, I just appreciate the flexibility, the responsiveness, um, the collaboration. We have, um, there is a screening workshop on the Cedar City South Interchange, so I guess we'll get some ideas of what that might look like for when that call comes. Then, when that call comes before Christmas, when the call comes to me before Christmas, um, I just there's just so much good to say about the people in this room and and those they represent, wherever they are, and how they respond to community interests and concerns. Thank you. Most well, referring to. Great. No one here knew that, did they? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Wasatch Regional, uh, Wasatch Front Regional Councils had a lot of meetings uh, in the last two months, and uh, I've attended most of them. Some of them have some conflicts that haven't been able to make, but they're actively planning, putting the programs forward that we're eventually seeing. And uh, so it's good to be a part of that. Thank you. I also attended Dixie Transportation Executive Council meeting, which Laura Hansen from the Governor's Office of Planning attended and talked about that the statistics and surveys that I have gathered and information I shared. On the Community Impact Board, we had the nine projects, actually eight projects, uh, five of them got approved, three of them got rejected because of too much. Mr. Chairman, yes. Just you know, it's good to come together as a commission. It's good to have all of the UDOT here. We get these information. We've had a number of private and our municipalities, counties, and government met with us. We appreciate that input. I hope that you know they leave thinking we have a listen to them because we have we do sometimes we just can't make commitments and all of us works in this prioritization and uh there's the state of utah has some fun times ahead of them we were growing out of that little to that big it's uh, it's size right? for me it's big <laughs> but you know we we want to listen i told the gentleman from Eagle Mountain, I said, we'll just cry a lot of tears and, and you know, get there and we'll smile and say, yeah, we understand, but understand we still have a process that takes place. And so I think uh, as we get administering the transportation and movement of people from Arizona to Idaho to Nevada to Colorado, Wyoming, it's a big job. And uh, we just have to. You know, it's easy. Local government, you're focused on 
those people that are in your district and, and it's easy to give them answers and you can know and you can always blame it on you dot or the commission that we're not listening but when we sit here in this position as a state board we always have to take the whole and come up with the best decisions and we've been fortunate that the economy has been well enough that we've had a lot of money i told carlos here a little bit ago when we we spent a billion dollars there that that's just something that was july that state that was july that was total but that was i think from this book in july one right carmen yeah that was from july one it says we've advertised just under a billion dollars my question i had during the meeting and didn't ask but i want to ask now we saw this almost 570 billion dollars that was spent in washington county does that include what's been spent in Iron County? No, no, no that's no. just Washington County. What is that total? <laughs> I'm going to have to do some work. I can get it for you. I'm just curious. Because I know you cry a lot. <laughs> hey, I'm waiting for a grant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping the feds are going to help with that. Have a happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Yeah. We truly live in a, at a time and in a state that we can be thankful for many things. And thank you for all you do. You're here. Carlos, any more? Mr. Chair, thank you for that offer, but you've heard enough from us. <laughs> ben, Lisa, anything? Region directors? No, thank you. Yes, we appreciate you all. Can, uh, can I just ask a question about the committee or the commission meetings for next year? Yes, we because can. Because normally we come to sunny St. George when it's sunny, not up in St. George. <laughs> and so, would there be any consideration in not being here in June? I don't know. Could we swap? Mon Monty, it there was a reason for that. What did you decide on why you want to have the Washington County? I think, first of all, they wanted to showcase the Washington County's new building, and it's a new building. They had accepted the first vessel. I'm just wondering if we could swap um, Monticello and Washington County so that we're not yeah. going to Monticello in the potential winter. Perfectly fine with that. I agree. In fact, I was under the impression that the recommendation would have been for Monticello to Aaron and for uh, Washington County in November or something. So we would be back in Washington County a year from now. If that's acceptable. Just it, it was just a question. No. Okay. I thought that was a true recommendation. Was just that the swap those two days, but appear in the calendar. Whatever the commission decides, whatever your prefer, whatever is good. Next commission meeting is December 15th, obviously. If you have received your invitation, commission, please. RSVP the head of as soon as possible so that all the people come in and make that arrangement. And of course, as you know, in a few days' time, we will have the celebration of the Thanksgiving. My dear friends, so due to the division among us in this country and around the world, we can no longer eat and drink and be merry. We have to really take a limited assessment of our lives, of our country, and what we do. So this time at Thanksgiving, would you please just put the eagle and the, I guess, Dallas Cowboys game on the pause, and just constantly going to get the families together and expressing your love and appreciation for that then because time is really running fast and furious. We need to get hold of our lives. We need to be sure that we extend our love and appreciation to our family members, to friends and the neighbors. See if you can help any neighbor during the Thanksgiving season rather than watching the football. Extend your help and hand to the leading ones in the community. This is a time we can really overcome our own personal challenges and extend our love and appreciation to others and make sure that we can contribute to peace in the world. That is my appreciation to you, to your families, and on behalf of the Commission, all of us, we love you. We know you have a hardest job in the world with the least amount of money and appreciation. But know that you are loved. You are in our prayers every day. And I'm pretty sure you know that you are our heroes. So thank you. May God bless you all and your families and happy Thanksgiving to you all.
With that, I would like to have a last item of the agenda, motion to adjourn. So, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Have fun. Thank you.